Super Mario Brothers is a series of video games where you hit floating blocks, jump on turtles, save princesses, and make the same joke for over a decade. Nintendo's Mario has to be the most recognizable video game character of all time, comparable to Disney's Mickey Mouse. Except I hate Disney for the soulless, money-hungry overlord that it is. And of course Nintendo can't be anything like that since they have Mario. Century-old corporate overlord is my friend and I love them. Just like Google. Google, who is my friend too, and is amazing. <laughs> eh. <laughs> the Super Mario series is magical, fun, consistent, sometimes too consistent, and full of games that deserve to be celebrated. I'd do anything for Mario. Anything. So why don't we look through each of his main 2D games to see what they brought to the table, but also see how they impacted the series and why they still stand out to this day. We'll start with the original Super Mario Brothers, back all the way from the NES, and make our way to present day with the plumber's newest game, Search Engine Optimization 2. Now I'm not going to say that Shigeru Miyamoto created video games when he and his small team designed the original Super Mario Brothers. I'm also not here to say that Mario was the first game with side-scrolling, or the first side-scrolling platformer. Heck, Pac-Lan came out a year before Super Mario did. God, that game sucks though. But what they did create was something truly captivating that stuck out in the gaming landscape at the time. Super Mario Brothers is a game about a short, chubby Italian man going through a strange array of obstacle courses in order to retake fortresses in order to get to the ultimate goal of saving Princess Toadstool from the clutches of King Koopa and his black magic. This short, chubby Italian man who is also killing innocent toads along the way that had been turned into floating blocks. This has never been brought up again in the history of Mario, by the way. And neither has this elusive mushroom king that's apparently the dad of Princess Toadstool. Alas. Before Mario's big focus was on platforming, it was apparently on shooting. And Mario was going to have guns, like rifles and beam guns. But they decided against that, thank god. I can't imagine Mario with a gun. What makes this original game so special is that it manages to capture the essence of adventure as you explore a diverse kingdom. You'll be going through bushy plains with mountains in the background, dark underground caverns, or mushrooms that reach to the sky. You'll be swimming through entire oceans, you'll be going through day and night, you'll be climbing into the very heavens, until the last level of each of the eight worlds where you'll face one of the King Koopa's castles totaling to 32 levels of pure platforming bliss. Rather than just throwing enemies and other obstacles about at seemingly random, we have carefully crafted memorable levels that still stand out over 30 years later. Trying to impede on your journey are obvious faces that any one of us would be able to recognize like Goombas, Koopa Troopas, Cheep Cheeps, Hammer Brothers, and so on. Enemies aren't the only thing that keep you on your toes as you play. The game also incentivizes looking around for secrets or power-ups. These could be as simple as certain blocks that may give you an ever-helpful fire flower, or they could be hidden invisible blocks or pipes with coins that may give you the extra lives you will need in order to reach the end of the game. Since, you know, this was back when, uh, lives meant something. If you look around hard enough, you'll be able to find areas that allow you to skip ahead a few worlds. These were good for players either trying to get through the game as quickly as possible, or for players who were trying to get back to a certain point in the game after they got a game over. Because not everyone knew you could just hold the A button on the title screen to get back to the world you got a game over on. Mario's controls are based off of him gaining momentum by running. Something kept in mind in the level design so that skilled players would be able to easily run past every obstacle. This would be something to help incentivize multiple playthroughs as you try to learn the course designs and how best you can get past them. Even though some people may be spoiled by Mario's later games that do have superior controls, may find this original outing to be a bit stiff in comparison, the two concepts of control and design were well thought out and work in harmony together for this original game. Miyamoto put a lot of thought into the first level and how the game would quickly teach things to the player on how to play, considering everything the player would be thinking and feeling. And this mindset would also be present in how he would go on to design the rest of the game, with such careful attention to the craft. As a kid who grew up with the NES original, since I had one of those Chinese bootleg plug-and-play consoles with pirated NES games on them, don't tell Nintendo. It felt like there were endless possibilities as I went through the levels. It just felt so magical and those memories will forever stay with me. I've played this game so many times through its many different forms 
that it's muscle memory just going through the entire game. And let me tell you, Super Mario Bros. 1 has a lot of different versions. The sheer amount of versions and re-releases Super Mario Bros. 1 has makes even Skyrim jealous. Miyamoto and his team had set out to make something different than what had been done before. They targeted the scope of what it would feel like to help take back an entire kingdom in peril over the course of a variety of stage types filled to the brim with secrets. They did so much with so very little, while keeping in mind the player's thoughts and sense of discovery. And not only did they succeed, but they helped rejuvenate the dying American video game market that had crashed in 1983, creating an icon that just about anyone and their mom can recognize. So naturally, the original Super Mario Bros. was a huge success. Obviously. To capitalize on this sudden interest the Japanese people had with Super Mario, Miyamoto and his team crunched for a sequel within the span of merely four months. As such, the game... Well, it looks and plays nearly identical to the first. There were some slight tweaks to the physics of the game and there were some graphical alterations here and there, adding slightly more detail. Slightly. But overall, it comes off as some ROM hack or altered version of the original Super Mario Bros. rather than a full-blown sequel. However, this time, Miyamoto knew that people had gotten a grasp on what Mario was. He didn't need to teach people the basics again. He knew that players would have played the levels over and over from the original. Thanks to this, Miyamoto's design philosophy for Mario 2 would be to craft a game with experienced players in mind. These levels would be far more difficult than the original Super Mario Bros., sometimes demanding near-perfect jumps in timing. Some people even describe these levels as masochistic. Even as a Mario veteran and someone who has beaten this game multiple times throughout multiple versions, some of these levels still make me feel anxious at times. And I'm not sure if I like that they still manage to do that or not. In Super Mario Bros. 1, there would be occasional puzzles in the castle levels, such as go in the right pathways, or in the case of the very last castle, go down the correct pipe, and then go on the correct pipe again, and then go in the correct pipe again. In Super Mario Bros. 2, you had exactly those types of puzzles, but also just in the normal levels, you had to figure out secrets to even progress through the flagpole. Levels would sometimes feel overly aggressive towards the player because of this or because of some secrets that would lead to warp zones that would take you backwards. This would honestly make me hesitant to try to go down pipes or go up vines because I didn't want to actively put my trust into the game when I felt it was very much against me. Taking the player from world 8 to world 5? Kinda a dick move. Adding on top of that, you have the implementation of mushrooms that would hurt Mario instead of powering him up and also faster moving red piranha plants that would appear out of the pipes even if you stand next to them, unlike the previous green piranha plants. It all makes for an experience that takes Mario and really challenges you on the fundamentals of the games. As a kid, there was something satisfying about beating a challenge like this, even though you would have to try a lot of times in order to do it. Since this game was known to me not as Super Mario Bros. 2, but instead Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels, the game felt like exploring an unknown uncharted land. As goofy, comedic, and stupid as this sounds because I'm talking about stupid fucking NES game, but... A little, little dramatic. These levels being something that not all players were able to see or get through due to the difficult and adverse nature of the game. It's impressive what Miyamoto and his team were able to do in a mere four months of development time, especially when you consider that, unlike the first Mario, there was no recycled levels throughout the 8 world campaign of Mario 2. The first Mario having quite the number of recycled levels. While still being so similar to the first Mario, all this makes Mario 2 stand out enough to appeal to its own crowd and is able to capture some of its own magic. But not just for these reasons alone. This was the first time in which Luigi was given his iconic higher jump and slippery controls. These attributes not only made him feel and played very differently from Mario, but would give experienced players a new way to approach levels. And if you were a real hardcore gamer and beat the game without using a single warp zone, you would be treated to a bonus world. World 9. When you're greeted with this new world, you'll notice it's called a fantasy world, and that's because it isn't a world with proper levels. It's more like a treat for dedicated players. After you would have had to have gone intimately familiar with the fundamentals of Mario in order to get to this world, World 9 throws those fundamentals out the window. 
The first level is an overworld level that's for some reason underwater. Weirdly enough, the third level, not the fourth, is the castle level in this world, in which there's a pipe that you can go in that takes you to the clouds for some reason, even though there's no pipe you're coming out of. What were they thinking? Drugs? Oh my god! There's also a good bit of empty space in these levels, like the castle level not even having any enemies or obstacles other than the Bowser at the end. But again, these aren't meant to be real levels, but rather a strange experience as a reward. These levels would be reminiscent of something that's somewhat popular nowadays, where people corrupt their favorite games in order to see strange, surreal things in them and gain a sense of enjoyment you wouldn't get by just playing them normally. As such, World 9 is little more than merely bragging rights and just a fun, weird experience. But, if you manage to beat the game a total of 8 times, then you go to the title screen and hold down A before you select to play as either Mario or Luigi, you then unlock 4 more worlds. Worlds A, B, C, and D. And these aren't just weird glitchy worlds again, these are four worlds with brand new proper levels to play. That is insane. A couple of these levels have segments that are lifted from levels from the main campaign, but it's not as though whole levels were lifted. And there are only a couple examples of this. Aside from that, these are brand new levels. I cannot express just how crazy that is. Imagine you're just playing your favorite game of all time, nonchalantly. You've played and beaten it, just shy of a dozen times or so, but suddenly you unlock 50% more content than you thought was originally in the game. That's magical! When you look at achievement statistics that show how many people actually bother to beat a video game, they're usually pretty low percentages. So imagine designing an extra 50% worth of game content to the very few people who beat your game 8 times. The amount of heart for the craft is palpable here. Whoever had the idea to do that has my absolute respect. One last thing I want to bring up before we move on to the next game. I just really wanted to bring up- Wait. Pause. Go back a second. Yeah. This blue Bowser guy. So you see at the end of each world in Mario 1 and 2, there would be a Bowser to defeat. However, these, except for the Bowser in the respected games world 8, are fake Bowsers. These fake Bowsers are common enemies costumed to appear as Bowser. You can see what they really are if you defeat them with Fire Mario. Regardless, these costume Bowsers are all identical to the real Bowser. But this Bowser, this blue Bowser, this guy's different. As such, according to conflicting sources, he could very well be Bowser's twin brother. I've been playing Mario games all my life, but I'm only just now finding out about this. The fact that somewhere out there, Bowser might have a twin brother. This is messing with my mind more than it has any reason to. The answer was right in front of us all along. Even Sakurai knew. From Super Mario Bros. 2, we move on to our next game, Super Mario Bros. 2. Or as it's known in Japan, Super Mario USA. It's called that because... The original Super Mario Bros. 2, the one released in Japan, both looked and played a lot like the original, but there was one huge difference. It was far more difficult. In fact, the level designs were borderline cruel at times, demanding a degree of platforming prowess we Americans apparently lacked. Concerned the game was just too tough, Nintendo of America cancelled the release. When Nintendo of America requested a more accessible sequel to Super Mario Bros., Nintendo of Japan saw Doki Doki Panic as a potential answer. To solve the sequel problem Nintendo of America wanted solved, Nintendo of Japan took Doki Doki Panic and gave it a Super Mario makeover. If you compare both these games side by side, you'll see it's the exact same video game. Now I feel pretty dorky even talking about Doki Doki Panic because it's literally something that takes up pretty much a quarter of any script covering this game. 
<clears throat> Super Mario 2 manages to simultaneously feel like a natural expansion from the foundation that the first game laid out, but also a complete departure from it. There are no Goombas or Koopa Troopas, instead we have a whole new army of baddies like Shy Guys, Sniffits, or Tweeters. We're no longer in the Mushroom Kingdom saving Toads or a Princess, now we're in the Kingdom of Subcon, saving its inhabitants known as Subcon and we're saving them from the clutches of our new antagonist, Wart. Among other bosses, like Birdo, who we fight at the end of most every stage. In Mario 2, you don't merely jump on enemies to defeat them. You have to jump on them, pick them up, and then throw them into another enemy. And that's the only proper way to defeat a standard enemy. Instead of super mushrooms or fire flowers, we have an upgradable health bar and vegetables that you can pull from the ground. You gain more max health by finding a red potion from the ground and strategically throwing it, making a door appear. On the other side of this door is a sort of parallel dimension, where if you enter from the right spot, you can find mushrooms that add one more heart to your max health. Although, your health goes back to two by the time you enter a new level, so you'll always be on the search for more mushrooms. Some of these mushrooms can be annoying to find and make you feel like you just wasted a potion if you're not able to pick the right spot for the door, but there are typically cues in the level design to give you hints at where one might be. In this parallel dimension, what would normally be vegetables in the normal world becomes coins that you can use in a slot machine minigame after every level, and this gives you a chance to get more lives. There are also mushroom blocks, which can be used as either weapons or platforms to get higher. Instead of getting invincibility stars out of question blocks, you have to collect five cherries to then unlock a slowly ascending star man that you can hopefully nab and isn't just stuck off screen just in a wall. There are no pipes in Mario 2. Instead, there are vases in which we can go in instead to find various items. Or in certain cases, working in tandem with a well-placed potion, some vases may work as a warp zone, springing you ahead a few worlds into the game, much like Mario 1's warp zones. You've probably noticed in the gameplay shown I have not been playing as Mario. And that's because in this game, you have a selection of four playable characters, and each have their own attributes. Mario is the most basic and well-rounded playstyle, with his jump and speed being average. Luigi is a bit more slippery than Mario, but jumps higher. Toad can hardly jump worth of anything, but he's incredibly fast. And Peach is slower, but has her floating ability that makes her go through the levels much easier. I've heard others say that for people who know the game inside and out, that Toad and Luigi are their superior characters to play as, to get through the levels as efficiently as possible, but I don't care. I will always play as Peach. Her floating ability may make some of the platforming bits child's play, but she's simply just the most fun to play as out of the four. Regardless, for a game released in 1988, it's impressive to see a cast of playable characters that are tuned to noticeably different playstyles. Level design philosophies have also changed a bit, now that there were some advancements in the understanding of the NES hardware. Before, in Mario 1, levels would mostly consist of one singular section. There may be one or two extra smaller sections, but the main level would only be one long stretch to get all the way to the right. But now, Mario 2 incorporates several sections for a single level, making them much lengthier now. Rather than having only horizontal levels, some portions of levels may also be vertical now. These vertical sections allowing the player to jump between the left and right of the screen as needed as well. All this would add whole new possibilities for level design the original Mario just wasn't capable of. As these levels are now longer, they removed the timer from the original game. This would help the player go at their own pace as they explore, and in some levels, they might be able to find multiple paths that lead to the same end. Not only that, but the number of levels goes down from the original 32 to 20 levels. That may not sound like a lot, but thanks to the level length and difficulty, this feels like a good amount of levels as the game doesn't overstay its welcome. While the original NES version of Mario 2 has its own charm, the best version of the game is by far the 2001 release Super Mario Advance on the Game Boy Advance. This would take the base game of Mario 2, but add so much more polish to the experience. On top of the obvious graphical upgrades, they added more enemies, 5 collectible ace coins to every level, a brand new boss, and the ability to rip off red and green Birdo's bow. Why does that last one matter at all? I don't know. It doesn't. I just like pointless polish, okay? They also add in way, way more replenishable hearts, which makes the game much more welcoming for beginners, but for me, I had no idea what to do with all the hearts the game would just keep throwing at me. I would have appreciated a harder difficulty mode to offset this and get rid of most of them, but a hard mode in Mario game? That's hard. 
to make apparently because we don't have it ever but it would be great because i also had way more lives than i knew what to do with as well i think i was pretty safe from ever getting a game over after you beat super mario advance you're given the extra quest to go find two yoshi eggs in each of the levels all of these eggs exist within the parallel dimension behind the red potion doors and can be a bit tricky to find but this gives the players reason to keep playing the levels over and over again they also added this blue spike thing that does whatever that is. You can't kill it, and touching it at all hurts you, of course, because it's a gigantic spike. But why is it here? It only appears once in the entire game, in this particular vase, in this one specific level. But it doesn't even act as an obstacle. You would think it's there to poke at a player from underneath as they ride the ferris wheel, but it's not even timed to properly pierce through the platforms. So it just sits there, presumably waiting for the player to just walk into it. It's rather baffling to me why they bothered to make it and put it in here at all when it accomplishes astonishingly nothing. Super Mario Bros. 2 is pretty split in the fanbase. Some love it, some don't like it at all. My editor, in fact, seems to kinda hate the game. Kane, would you care to come in and tell us why you don't like it? Because it feels like a knockoff. It doesn't even feel like a real Mario game. It's different and icky and <laughs> okay. weird and it's just All right, I get it. Moving on. Regardless of the split, it's undeniable that it still held a strong influence on the Mario series as a whole. Without this strange little diversion from the norm, we never would have gotten now iconic enemies including, but not limited to, Shy Guys, Pokies, and Bob-Bombs. So even if you don't like Mario 2, Kane... No, it's not even that I don't like it, it's just I feel it's only it... appropriate to at least respect the game for bringing in more creative enemies into the series. It's just a shame we never see Ward again in the history of anything, except for a reference in Link's Awakening. But I guess it does make sense when you consider that after you defeat Ward, he's bleeding out of his eyes before a whole society of fairy people beat him to a pulp. Just kidding, it was just, just, just a dream. It's just a dream. As revolutionary as Mario 1 was at the time, things were still rather simplistic. A criticism some may have for Mario 1 is that many of the levels felt too similar, even outside of the obvious reused levels. This obviously was due to the hardware being newer and the developers were still trying to work within their limitations. So in order to add some variety to a stage, they had just... Mm, had make it gray. Bam! Completely new and different for you. Uh, new... This is variety, just slightly different color. Mm. What I'm trying to say is that while Mario 1 had succeeded in its goal of trying to feel like a whole journey through an entire kingdom, and it did well within the limitations it had, what Mario 3 set out to do was to fully realize the potential of the NES hardware. The Mushroom Kingdom wasn't just brown blocks, blue blocks, gray castles. The Mushroom Kingdom was suddenly eight distinct lands most of which are now staples of your average Mario game today. We have Grassland, Desertland, Waterland, Giantland, Skyland, even though half of it is not in the sky, Iceland, Pipeland, and lastly Bowser's Domain, which is called Darkland, each with their own distinct music, feel, enemies, and gimmicks to make them stand out and memorable. The goal of each world is essentially the same as the first game, of course, going through levels with platforming challenges to get to the end castle to save the kingdom from the dark magic of King Koopa. But now, to cap off each world, we have a brand new type of level, airships, with worlds 1 through 7 featuring not Bowser as their boss, but one of the brand new Koopalings, who are King Koopa's adopted children. But there's way way more to talk about in the ways Mario 3 builds upon the strong foundation Mario 1 created. So let's first talk about Mario's transformations in Mario 3. It wouldn't be a Mario game without them. The series, Super Mario Bros., is after all named after the mustachioed plumber's ability to grow big after consuming power-up. From Mario 1 to 3, we have a huge jump in Mario's possible arsenal of items at his disposal. We have the Super Mushroom, Fire Flower, and Invincibility Star from the first game, but we also have the new Super Leaf to turn Mario into a flying raccoon, given that he has enough running space to lift off. The Tanuki Suit, which acts as a more superior but rarer version of Raccoon Mario. The Frog Suit, which allows Mario to swim underwater with ease. 
The hammer suit, which gives Mario the ability to throw hammers at enemies, much like the dreaded hammer brother himself. And finally, the P-Wing, which allows Mario to fly in the air indefinitely until they either beat the stage or get hit by an enemy. While this last power-up is, of course, the most overpowered, there's only a few given out to the player during the game as rewards, so it balances out. The Super Leaf is the big takeaway item for Mario 3. A player is able to use it to traverse stages with ease, using their tail to defeat enemies, break blocks, or float down gently to make platforming easier. Or again, with enough running space, Mario can count on the power of flight to get past difficult obstacles or to find new secrets and all new paths. The rare Tanuki suit has all the abilities that Raccoon Mario has with the Super Leaf, while also giving him the ability to transform into a statue, thus becoming immune from damage for a few seconds. Both of these power-ups are beloved by fans, which is probably why Nintendo loves bringing them back in later games. To pander to us. Constantly. The frog suit, while making water levels far more enjoyable by making them go by faster, isn't very good. On land it becomes absolutely worthless as you can't run or walk. You hop, which is slow and cumbersome to control. It's inevitable that you'll get hit by something and lose it, but that'll only come as a relief by that point. Aside from some water levels and some very specific secrets that require this suit, there's not much reason to use it. The hammer suit is another fan favorite. Why that may be is probably due to how few there are in the entire game, but how satisfying it is to be able to fling hammers across the screen at enemies. Adding on to that, this power-up, unlike the raccoon or tanuki suit, has never appeared in another Mario game. It's like a rare element that has to be delicately mined, polished, taken care of, and preserved in a museum for future generations. And I lost it! Great! Good. Now there's only like four of them in the entire game, and I just lost it. Cool. And while it may not appear in any other Mario game, it seems as this power-up does have a spiritual successor in Mario Maker 2. But we're getting ahead of ourselves, aren't we? Also, Fire Mario is all orange in this game. In every other game in the series ever, Fire Mario always has his white and red outfit. Even in Mario 1, or the later ports of this game, he has his usual white and red outfit. Such a drastic change, but it makes me really grow fond of this oddity that is purely orange Mario. It's the little things like that that still make the original NES version of the game worth going back to, even with the superior Super Nintendo and Game Boy Advance ports. This is, uh, this is another really pointless thing that I love that's exclusive to the NES version, but I'll share it with, it with you anyway because it's my video and I can talk about what I want. Since the developers clearly wanted to differentiate the tone of the ice world from other worlds that have blue skies, like the summery, warm grass world, they added white stripes to the background. Which seems like a strange choice, giving the sky stripes, but it certainly gives the world a different vibe and helps make it feel much more harsh and wintry. And I like that. More than I have any particular reason to. <laughs> All of these power-ups are available not only for your disposal, but also for your hoarding needs. You're able to keep an inventory of dozens of items, which you can use before you start a level, picking out which one you would think would best suit your situation for the level you're about to face. Speaking of this, now that we're on the screen, WABAM! We now have this all new overworld screen. For the first time in the series, you're not just going from level to level, but you are moving Mario himself to where you'd like to go, and which level you'd like to face next. Sometimes having the choice sprung onto you of which levels you would like to do, in what order, or which ones you just want to skip altogether. There's also other things on the world map to help break up the pacing a tad, with toad houses that give you more items for your inventory, a match mini game that I can never win to save my life, and all sorts of different Hammer Brothers, Boomerang Brothers, or Sledge Brothers, which also award you with new items. And speaking of items, we're not done talking about items! Because there are items that can be used on the overworld map. Meet the Lone Hammer, which allows you to break certain rocks to open new paths to get you to new toad houses or allow you to skip a level. The music box, which puts overworld enemies to sleep so you can sneak right past by him. The Lakitu Cloud, which turns Mario into a cloud to be able to skip over a level the player might find too difficult. And the Warp Whistle, which acts as this game's warp zone. There are only three of them in the entire game, and they're all very well hidden. This item makes a little tune when you blow into it, 
which is a nod to the first Zelda game, which also has a whistle on it with that same tune, the warp whistle in Zelda, also warping Link around the map of Hyrule. Jesus Christ, Miyamoto, could you make a single game in the 80s without warp zones? There is so much. This game is constantly rewarding you for moving forward, be it with items or new rooms. The levels in this game are short, usually being beaten within a single minute. They throw you into one theme for a minute, only to throw it completely away forever after using it for such a brief time, only to do something else completely different in the next stage, and then they throw that away, and they do something different again in the next stage after that, and so on, and so forth. An example of this is that there is a single stage with this exclusive power up we never see it again in another Mario game until Super Mario Maker 1, and that's the green Goomba shoe from World 5-3. Defeating a shoe to Goomba from below with a brick block allows the player to jump inside and be able to stand on blocks that would normally hurt Mario, or stomp on enemies that would otherwise be unstompable. But the second you beat the level, it's gone. You can't take it to any other level, and it just doesn't exist in any other level but this one. That's just like Nintendo. To come up with a cool concept that's fun and unique, but then immediately throwing it away before it gets too tiresome. Or in this case, throwing it away before fully realizing what level design could be produced from this sort of mechanic. Thankfully, they would later rectify this by bringing it back and using it in a unique way for an e-reader level, but it would have been nice to see the shoe appear in at least one more level in Vanilla Mario 3. The pacing in this game is immaculate, with these stages having so many secrets in them to keep a curious player busy and ushering you into replaying the game over and over, while you're still able to find new things. There's a secret in 610 that I, for years, could never remember how to get to. Me, who has managed to memorize most of the secrets from all the 2D Mario games, have up until now gotten stumped time and again by Mario 3. In this one instance, at least. There are enough secrets and alternate paths in this game to make each playthrough still feel fresh. Super Mario Bros. 3 somehow manages to hide its age very well. Aside from some screen flickering that's not present on the Switch emulation of this game. The game holds up remarkably well with its crisp, colorful, cartoony sprites that still look just as beautiful today as they did back then. Super Mario Bros. 3 and Kirby's Adventure remain the best looking NES games out of them all. It's honestly difficult for me to come up with gripes for this game, even minor nitpicks. It does so much to build off of what the original Mario did while pushing ahead with so many new things that have become standard for Mario games to come. I suppose if I were to come up with one gripe, it would be that the bosses are too easy. Aside from King Koopa, who still is a unique ending boss in how they executed it. But Boom Boom, the boss for every fortress level in the game, is an absolute joke. You can kill him without a problem in mere seconds. Some Boom Booms have different forms, like growing a pair of wings, but when you defeat them before they even have a chance to do anything, it's hard to take them seriously. But we cannot end this section on Mario 3 without talking about the two super secrets this game has. A couple of features of the game so stupidly obtuse to find that you could easily play through this game a dozen times and not even see either of them. That would be the White Toad House and the Coin Airship. For such small things that so few players would have experienced, or even understand how to unlock, they must be worthwhile, right? So, the White Toad House. In order to unlock one of these, you must collect a certain number of coins, sometimes needing all the coins in the whole level. But this is only the case for certain levels in the game. One level per the first seven worlds. The game gives you absolutely no indication that these secret toad houses exist, or what levels would be the right one in order to unlock the houses from. It would all just have to happen from chance. That or you looking up online how to do it like I totally didn't do. In these toad houses, you either get a P-Wing, if it's an odd-numbered world, or if it's an even-numbered world, you get a super secret item, the anchor. These white toad houses are the only way you can get the anchor too. You may be wondering what a super secret item like this may do, since it's only available if you stumble into collecting a certain number of coins in very specific levels, of only the even numbered worlds, excluding the last world. But let me tell you, it's essentially worthless. For you see, when you get to the last level of each world, the airship, and you die, 
the airship will move somewhere else on the overworld map. Every time you die on the airship, it will keep moving, making it very extremely super duper mega miter inconvenient to get back to it, maybe? <laughs> but if you do somehow manage to get and use this anchor item, then the airship will just stay in place. And that's all it does. So who cares? It's junk? Okay, thank you, next super secret this game has, please. The coin airships. Alright. Breathe. <clears throat> in order to unlock a coin airship, you must first either be in worlds 1, 3, 5, or 6. A hammer brother must still be left alive on the overworld map. The player must end a stage, any stage, with a coin total that's a multiple of 11. The tens digit of the player's overall score must match the multiple of 11. I.e., if your coin total is 44, your tens score digit must be 4. But... Since the player is awarded additional points for collecting the end card at the goal based on how much time you have left, each second giving the player an additional 50 points, you should try to hit the end card when your timer is an even number, so your additional awarded points will be a multiple of 100, thus not ruining your tens digit. And then, on the overworld map, the Hammer Brother will magically turn into a coin ship. The stage itself isn't much, but it is satisfying to collect so many coins at once. At the end, you face the bro foes and collect your reward as typical for an overworld enemy. So the main thing that's changed from all this is that you have a few more coins. Doing this on purpose doesn't necessarily amount to much, just like the white toad houses, but due to the oddly specific nature of these secrets, it does add more charm and magic to the overall experience. Especially if you were to imagine how it was back in the early 90s when this game came out in America. Being able to tell your friends about this totally wicked secret you've never seen before and aren't sure how you even got. And then they don't believe a word you're saying because they've never seen it so you're totally just making it up, trying to be cool, probably. Making it up, just like what Miyamoto did with this whole game. Whoa! Mario 3 was just stage play since the game opens with curtains going up, ends with curtains going down. The end goals are off-stage setups. Platforms were held up by rope or some were bolted to the background and you could go behind the background like some stage extras. Whoa, Miyamoto, you did it again. Blowing my mind, wow, dude. It's so insane to see how many new things Mario 3 came up with that immediately became the standard for Mario games to do. New colorful power-ups, airship stages, the seven Koopalings, mid-world fortresses with a boss, Mario 3's new enemies like Dry Bones, Boos, Thwomps, Chain Chomps, Munchers, Fire Snakes, among others. And again, the existence of the overworld, which is present in essentially every other 2D Mario game after this. This game was a big deal. While Americans were used to the idea of Mario changing things up thanks to our release of Super Mario Bros. 2, just imagine how mind-blowing this was for Japanese players when just two years prior they got a ROM hack sequel of Mario 1. Such a huge frickin' jump between two. Oh my god. There is a lot to Mario 3, and I'm sure I could talk even more about it, but I think I got the gist across to ya. There is an impressive amount of content and creativity in this game. It's no surprise that this game is many people's favorite Mario game, or that many others regard it as one of the best video games ever created. There was just so much love and passion put into this game, as it really pushed Mario as far as he could go on this old Nintendo Entertainment System. But now, my friends, it's finally time for us to leave the NES and jump forward. It's time to go up a generation to the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. So how do you make a follow-up for a game so revolutionary as Mario 3, where you go to eight distinct and memorable worlds, which housed many secrets of wonder and excitement? You make a game based around the very idea of exploring an extensive new world with longer levels which had even more obstacles and even more secrets, all the while having to get the game out the door as quick as you can. But we'll get to that. In Mario World, after you start a new game and get past the intro screen, the first thing you're presented with is this cramped overworld. It's very reminiscent of what an overworld map in Mario 3 would look like. But after you beat the first boss and step off this initial island, you get to see just how big the overworld really is. This is when you knew you were in for a real adventure. 
the place of your adventure being known as Dinosaur Land, which fittingly has dinosaurs. It also has a forest of illusion, that of which seems oddly similar to a certain other sort of mysterious woods. Football players that throw baseballs. Four differently colored switch palaces to discover, which may make certain levels easier or harder after you switch them on. Ghost houses, which were a completely new level theme. A sunken ship, which is one of the airships from Mario 3, but apparently crashed into the ocean. And secrets. Secrets. Am I saying this enough? More secrets. Exploration and discovery plays a major key in Mario World. Before, with Mario 3, there were always plenty of things to discover and find, but it all played to the end of you getting to the one goal of the level, which would then get you to the end of the world, which would then take you to the next world. In Mario World, you could actually replay levels at any time via the overworld, and there are levels with more than just one exit. Finding a level's secret exit then unlocks a brand new path, which may take you to a new level or branch you off into a different world or in some cases, to Star Road, which acts as a secret world that is then connected to the other worlds in the game. This would have Dinosaur Land feel much more natural, as some secrets would have you dipping in and out of different parts of the areas and islands. But it doesn't end there, because you have Secret World inside of a Secret World, one where the levels can act as a challenge even for more experienced Mario players. Beating the Secret World within a Secret World has you unlock an Autumn version of the Overworld, where some enemy sprites change in the levels. It's something small, but it stands out as being a unique and fun reward for the player. Something I desperately wish they would revisit in another game. Please? There may be a lot of secret exits, but it's not overwhelming to where you don't know if you've explored a level enough to find everything. Thankfully, every level that has more than one exit is red on the overworld map, while levels with just one exit are yellow. Unless you are like how I was when I was a kid, AKA stupid, because I didn't realize what the red dots meant and I just thought any level could have a secret exit. It took me a few years to actually put two and two together and let me, let me tell you, the revelation that I was just a complete and utter idiot shook me more than I had any right to. The feedback loop of Mario 3 is always about moving forward and giving you things to reward forward progression. It has short fast paced levels and it keeps you moving. Mario World's feedback loop involves the player going back to bigger levels numerous times to find new rooms, get new exits, and to explore the map. In a way, it kind of makes Mario World feel like the more meatier game, if that makes sense. This creates different feels between Mario 3 and World, and may help explain that while they both are a couple of the best Mario games ever made, they each have their respective camps that prefer one over the other. One of the secret levels in Mario World is known as Top Secret Area. This is just a single screen where you can stock up on power-ups. This was more than likely added due to the lack of mushroom houses in an inventory screen on the overworld map like from Mario 3. But instead having it be this secret level hidden away in a corner of the map makes it feel like you're finding a treasure trove of goodies. Though it does get annoying to have to go back and forth between the current level you're on and all the way back to World 2 every time you just want a cape. Take that inconvenience as the price you pay for getting power-ups anytime you want, if you wish. Top Secret Area is also identifiable as being a cutesy blushing hill in the Game Boy Advance release of the game. I love him. He deserves to be happy. Back in the early days of YouTube when ROM hacking was young and we were all kids and stupid, or at least I was, there would be videos made about a super ultra secret area where it would either be a hidden level or hidden power-up. These would all be fake, obviously, but you didn't know that when you were 10 and you just wanted to get to the super ultra mega secret that this one person on the internet could find, but you couldn't, and just please, there's gotta be something over there. Just, why would they put an island right there if there's not something there? Super Mario World would have a unique enemy situation. Of course, we have brand new enemies introduced, such as Rexes, Charging Chucks, Magikoopas, Resnor, Fishbones, Fuzzies, and so on. But Mario World had a stark absence of key enemies we can't imagine modern Mario games without, like bloopers or chain chomps. But I feel like I've taken for granted an aspect of Mario World up until now, and that's what the game had done to reinvent pre-existing enemies. You have Goombas, but now they don't die from just being stomped on. Now you can grab them and knock them into other enemies, almost like in Super Mario USA. 
This change to the Goombas would also highlight the importance of grabbing items in Mario World, where you could finally throw turtle shells upwards and carry keys to keyholes for new exits. These Goombas, as we see them in Mario World, would be later retconned to be an entirely unique species of Goombas known as Galoombas, regardless of the fact that they were referred to merely as Goombas in the original manual of Mario World. Previously, Koopa Troopas would come in two colors, green for the ones that would fall off ledges, and red for the ones that turned around on ledges. In the NES games, these guys would be jumped on, and then you could kick their shells. Or in Mario 3, you could also grab their shells. But in Mario World, suddenly we have four different types of Koopa colors. Green and red, but then yellow and blue. Blue Koopas are like the red ones, but move faster. And yellow ones are like the green ones, but try to follow after Mario. A completely new element for these guys is now that once you stomp on them, you hit them out of their shell. And depending on the shell color they were in, this would determine their behavior once they got kicked out of their shell. Whether they'd hop right back into their shell, or if they'd just end up kicking their own shell back at you. Or if they're a Koopa jumping into a yellow shell, they would become invincible from attack. Unless you just do a spin jump. This is the first game in which Lakitu's cloud is rideable if you defeat him in a way other than jumping onto his head. Dry bones now throw projectiles at you in set intervals. Hammer Brothers would be replaced by these guys known as Amazing Flying Hammer Brother. They ride on platforms that would sway back and forth while throwing hammers every which way. Defeating one from the bottom allows you to use its platform. Wrench molds that would appear on airships in Mario 3, which were Moles that had turtle shells on their backs for some reason are now just normal moles and they pop out of the ground to chase you. And finally, Piranha Plants, a staple since the second level of Mario 1, have now been completely changed as well. There's only a single level in the entire game that has usual Piranha Plants, while every other Piranha Plant in every other level has these newer jumping Piranha Plants that pop out of pipes. This is also the first time we see enemies like Ninji and Pokey reappear from Mario USA. Pokey, who had gotten his now staple yellow color from this entry. Since I've grown up alongside most every Mario game, I feel like I've taken for granted something that we more than likely will never see again. Rather than taking all the enemies from the previous games and just using them as we had remembered them, we have Nintendo changing up their behaviors to make them feel distinct from the previous entries while designing levels around these new characteristics. While that would be really interesting to see again Nintendo taking these characters and revamping them into brand new ways, I don't see that happening. <laughs> For this game, Mario's number of power-ups goes down a bit, focusing largely on Fire Flowers or the new Cape power. Mario World may not have as many power-ups as Mario 3, but would go on to be the first game to star Mario's dinosaur companion, Yoshi. Yoshi had been a feature Miyamoto wanted since the very first Super Mario Bros., but he knew that the NES hardware wasn't capable for something as advanced as a writable companion. Eh, hey, wait a minute. There's four different Yoshi colors, each having their own ability when they swallow a shell. Yellow Yoshi is the worst one, just stomps around. Red Yoshi's okay, he spits fire. Blue is by far the best one because he allows you to fly for a long time. And green doesn't do anything particularly special, and his ability is dependent on what color of shell he has in his mouth. So, I mean, he's okay. Back to the new cape power-up, though, which you get from a feather. I don't know how feather equals cape. But now that I think about it, I don't know how leaf equals raccoon, so I'm, I'm not worried about it. The cape allows Mario to hit nearby enemies and fly much like the raccoon ability from Mario 3. But the cape is not as easy to control as Raccoon Mario. You have to actively control Mario's ascension at certain intervals in order to continue getting height and airtime. This makes it as powerful as Raccoon Mario and as OP since you can fly over levels, but it's an ability that a player has to learn to use rather than just using it from the get-go. Bosses are still pretty easy, again. I do give them credit for giving them more variety than the last game though. Most of the Koopalings have their own style of boss fight. Some ghost houses have a unique mini boss with a big boo. And we have a new mid-fortress boss, the previously mentioned Reznor. And we can't forget about Bowser, who they colored their sprite incorrectly for, and didn't even notice that they did that until they had to redraw him for Super Mario Maker. Great. But his boss fight is memorable with his first appearance inside his clown car. I got stuck on him as a kid, and it took me ages to figure out the very predictable pattern to beat him. But 
I felt like a genius when I did figure it out. I'll tell you what, the last castle is also worthy of note due to the replayability of it. Much like the nature of the full game. You'll have three main challenge rooms before you get to Bowser, but you essentially get to choose what your first two challenges will be by a selection of doors. Some are easier than others, and there will be trial and error, but it's fun to at least check by each door. Or you could skip the first two challenge rooms completely by going into the castle via the secret back door. I'm a fan of back doors, personally. Do you get it? Let's talk graphics. The game looks... good. It has a distinct style that sets it apart from the Mario games before and after it, but in terms of what the Super Nintendo was capable of, we will go on to see many titles that surpass Mario World with graphics and overall presentation. Which is understandable, this happens with the beginning of a console's life. The developers are still trying to learn the ins and outs of the hardware to fully capitalize on their limitations. The same thing happened between Mario 1 and 3 after all. But Mario World would go on to be the only 2D outing Mario had on the Super Nintendo. And Yoshi's Island doesn't count, so it's a bit harder to look past it. When you consider that levels start looking too similar between early and later levels, it becomes even harder to look past, and makes you wish that they had the time to fit in more tile sets to help distinguish the different areas of Dinosaur Land. Going back to play Mario World for the millionth time to record footage for the video, I noticed things that I don't think ever happened to me before. How in the world did I just kill an enemy four blocks below me? How did this shell go through the block from the top and somehow manage to make the item pop out? So when you're killing a charging chuck with your cape, he goes flying off screen. So it's kind of weird when this one decides to go down the slope as a slide before his descent to the bottomless pit below. But I understand wanting a little bit more fun before you die. I get it. And lastly, what just happened here? Super Mario World is so magical that you can just fall into the ground for some asinine reason. Good. Speaking of magical game code that's so whimsical that it can occasionally just be nonsensical and kill you because it just wanted to, Super Mario World is so magical that with arbitrary code execution, you can code entirely different games into it. Like Snake. And Flappy Bird. That's all I have to say about that, really. People have a lot of time on their hands. I'm talking slower so that gameplay of Flappy Bird can be on screen longer. It's said that the development of Super Mario World was rushed, which makes sense considering it had to be ready for the launch of the Super Nintendo. There's a lot of unused code and graphics left in on the cart, and Miyamoto would go on to say that many scrapped ideas from Mario World's development would instead go on to be used for future Mario titles. But with how much content the game has regardless of the crunch, it manages to still captivate and engage people. Something I'm sure Fallout 76 is jealous of. I did absolutely gush about Mario 3 in the last section, and I may have sounded a bit more harsh on Mario World in comparison, but thanks to the overall charm of Mario World, it's probably my favorite classic 2D Mario game. There may be less overall variety compared to 3, but there's still plenty to love about Mario World. It's no wonder that these are the two games people debate over which one is the best 2D Mario game, and why these are the two games Nintendo constantly takes inspiration from. Inspiration loosely, more like ripping off. All of the games we've been talking about up until now have been on the home console front. But Nintendo of course wasn't just working on their NESs or their SNESs. They had their game NESs as well. Two 2D Mario games were made for the Game Boy. Those being Super Mario Land and Super Mario Land 2. These games are weird. Now, Mario of course was created by Shigeru Miyamoto, and he, more times than not, has an iron grip on what is or isn't in Mario games. To the extent that he got upset and threatened to cancel an entire game's development just because someone wanted to put a gold block on Mario's head, and Shiggy didn't like that. Point is, Miyamoto has been Mario's gatekeeper, who up until more recently likes having him under lock and key. But, Around the development of Mario Land 1 and 2, Miyamoto had been far too busy with other projects to be the head of development. 
As such, it would be Gunpei Yokoi, the guy behind games like Metroid, Kid Icarus, and the Game Boy itself, who would take the leading role in developing the Mario Land series. The Mario Land series can be best illustrated as Miyamoto being an overbearing parent who goes out of town for the weekend, so the kids decide to go crazy and have a party when they're out. Mom's gone! Mom's gone! Quick, let's make a game before they get back! Rather than the usual Mushroom Kingdom, our first Mario Land game takes us to a kingdom that Mario has yet to ever visit again, Sarasa Land. The ruler of this new kingdom being Daisy rather than Peach. This of course being the first time we ever see Daisy. Which, if that's a good or bad thing that we got Daisy thanks to this game. Nintendo! Whoa! Right! Yeah! What? <laughs> yeah! 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 I'll let you decide. The game has you going through four worlds. One based off of Egypt, one based off of the supposed lost continent of Mew, one designed after Easter Island, and China. Our story involves an alien named Tatanga who has taken over Sarasaland by hypnotizing the inhabitants. Fairly typical stuff for a game like this, aside from the bad guy being an alien. Which, it's fitting having the creator of Metroid oversee a Mario game where the antagonist is a weird alien. And finally, we can talk about the game itself. It has not aged particularly well. Due to Super Mario Land being a launch title for the Game Boy, the developers were still trying to work around their limitations, as is per usual with this type of thing. So, every single one of the 12 levels reused sections of themselves. If you look for it, you'll notice at least one part of the level that ends up repeating by the end of the stage. They usually do a decent job hiding this fact, so most players aren't going to notice this. Or care? Usually. It was just used as a way to keep memory down, but pad out the length of the level. Even with this padding, you can still beat the game within 25-30 minutes. Also due to early limitations, the graphics are all super teeny tiny. And for the same reason, turtle shells, rather than bounce off of walls, explode. And also, also, the Fire Flower is now replaced with the Super Ball Flower. The Super Ball Flower lets you throw one singular ball around the screen to kill enemies or collect coins. Miss your target though, and you'll have to wait several seconds for the ball to disappear to try to shoot out another one. Because of this and how clunky it can feel if you miss your mark, the Super Ball has to be the lamest Mario power-up ever devised. The momentum is all off too. It doesn't feel tight, and the second you hold down the run button, Mario is zooming off too quickly. You don't build momentum, you just have it in an instant. This doesn't stop you from suddenly losing all momentum when you make a jump, which helps you make jumps easier to make so you're not zooming around mid-air, but it doesn't feel natural and it's something you have to get used to. Regardless of these limitations and problems, the game is still fun to play, which is the most important bit. The levels, while simple in design, do feel distinct enough from one another between the four worlds, thanks to different background objects and enemies exclusive to certain worlds. The added variety of having a submarine level and an airplane level helps as well. And again, the fact that there are only 12 levels. You'd really have to try to make them all similar at that point. It's a fun game for a half hour's distraction, but it's not something that can be held up anywhere near in the same regard as, say, Mario 3 or World. Or even the original Super Mario, for that matter. Not even close. Your Soviet Union type propaganda shall not fool me. I see through the lies. The sequel, Mario Land 2 on the other hand, acts as a complete 180 for Mario Land 1. Immediately you can notice this by the larger, more detailed sprites and environments. And they actually program shells to be kicked this time. It's not the smoothest looking thing, but... It works. After getting a good look at the game, the second you start moving around, you'll notice that they fix the momentum. It's not quite there on the level of either Mario 3 or World, but it's an improvement for Mario Land by leaps and bounds. Mario Land 1 was pure distilled platforming through simple horizontal stages that only go right. You may get thrown one weird little gimmick, but don't count on anything particularly outstanding. Whereas Mario Land 2 manages to consistently dish out creative new level themes and tile sets, giving even the far more advanced Mario World a run for its money. In Mario Land 2, you'll be going to six zones in order to defeat Wario, who has his first appearance ever in this game. Wario has invaded Mario's mansion, which he inexplicably owns on his own private island that we never see or hear from ever again. So rather than the usual saving a damsel, Mario has a brand new goal in Mario Land 2. In these six different zones, you have memorable levels that include, but are not limited to, an anthill 
inside the plumbing of a house. Japanese temples with yokai spirits inside of a whale. Ball place and even space. I can't even imagine Mario in space. You have weird enemies that don't appear in any other Mario games too, like a shark with punching gloves, a fish cattle thing, and ants. Ants. So many ants. And unlike Mario's before or after, you actually get to choose the order you wish to play these six zones from the very start. Making multiple playthroughs is fun as you're able to go to the levels you want at the pace you want. Replayability being important as it is a smaller handheld game. Thankfully, we also have the return of my favorite, secret levels. These secret levels aren't fully realized levels though, sadly. They can largely be summed up as smaller areas that have more coins than usual and maybe a power up for you. There could be a handful of enemies sprinkled in there, but it's nothing too noteworthy like Mario World secret levels. This makes me mostly forget about finding the secret exits on levels on return playthroughs, which is one of the more disappointing aspects of the game. Power ups aren't anything particularly special, but they get the job done. Mushroom, Fire Flower, Bunny Ears. The bunny ears act like Raccoon Mario from Mario 3, discounting the ability to fly. The fire flower is given more of a purpose this time around though, now that in levels you can find blocks that can only be destroyed by throwing fireballs at them, these blocks commonly being in the way of hidden rooms and items. A concept originally seen in Mario 3 with ice blocks that you could melt, but those were limited to only the ice themed levels. After defeating each boss in the six zones, one of those bosses being Tatanga as a nice little cameo, you unlock the ability to reach Mario's overrun mansion, which acts as the last level. In it, you will go through a three story platforming gauntlet, each section having its own unique traps and challenges, before you get to a three phase Wario fight. Since the game allows you to go to any of the six zones in any order you choose, they're all roughly around the same difficulty. That's something that the developers admit to having some trouble balancing. So it's fair to say that this last level does feel like a sudden difficulty spike. This was something that really stumped me as a kid, as you would have to learn how to react to so many different types of traps even towards the end of the level. Regardless, it has to be up there as one of the best ending stages to any Mario game being a good last challenge for the player. The game has a length that's roughly three or four times longer than Mario Land 1, but still only amounts to about half the length of its highly praised console counterparts. For those of you lost in my nonsense right there, what I'm trying to say is the game is going to last you roughly two hours. But for two hours, you get a finely crafted game that clearly had a lot of thought and love put into it. A Mario game that honestly doesn't get the recognition that it should, as people seem to mostly forget about the Mario Land games. The magic of both of these games comes from how obvious it is that Miyamoto was not involved in them. This not only shows how tight of a vision Miyamoto had on his original Mario projects, but also what other developers could do with the pudgy Peace. plumber. These games would show ideas for Mario that we might never have seen if Miyamoto just happened to have the spare time for them. It's weird to think what Miyamoto would have created instead. But I'm more than happy with what we got if it means that we can live in a world where Mario gets to explore the innards of a fully aquatic, placental marine mammal. Having Mario in your pocket was an insane idea, and it still blows my mind the jump of quality between Land 1 and 2, showing how well the development team had learned the ins and outs of the Game Boy by the time they got to making Land 2. And if it weren't for these games existing and wanting to try to do things a bit differently, we wouldn't have such beloved characters like Wario. Or... Wario. As consoles moved on to more 3D experiences, we wouldn't see a 2D Mario game on either the Nintendo 64 or GameCube. We also, oddly, never saw a new 2D Mario game on the Game Boy Advance either. Instead, the Game Boy Advance had numerous ports of older games, which may have been a shame for some, but for people such as myself, who were too young to have grown up with a NES or a SNES, it was the perfect opportunity for us to catch up on the classics. 1992 was the year that Mario Land 2 released, and it wouldn't be until 2006 that we would get the next real, newest 2D Mario game, of which was developed for the Game Boy Advance's successor, the Nintendo DS. This game, which would go on to spark its own specific sort of series, consisting of four games. But this is where we get into a bit of a problem, in that during our adventure on this first DS title, we go through Grass World, Desert World, Beach World, 
Forest World, Ice World, Mountain World, Sky World, and Bowser World. And then in the sequel, New Super Mario Bros. Wii, we go through Grass World, Desert World, Ice World, Beach World, Forest World, Mountain World, Sky World, and Bowser World. And then in New Super Mario Bros. U, we have... Grass world, desert world, beach world, ice world, forest world, mountain world, sky world, and Bowser world. Oh, but don't worry. New Super Mario Bros. 2, the third game in the series, decided to mix things up a bit. Grass world, desert world, forest world, ice world, sky world, and Bowser world. The other two worlds kind of just stopped caring about themes and decided to do whatever they wanted. But then you might be wondering how, if all of these games had very similar level themes, how did they differentiate from one another? And I'll tell you! New Super Mario Bros. Wii brought in local four-player co-op, which wasn't fun unless you were playing with only one other person, and brought back the Koopalings to reprise their roles from Super Mario Bros. 3 and World as main bosses. They also added in the new power-ups, the propeller suit, the ice flower, and the penguin suit. New Super Mario Bros. 2 kept the Koopalings again, brought in the Raccoon Leaf Power-Up from Mario 3, the mid-boss Resonor from Mario World, and added the Golden Flower, which lets you turn things into coins, but the developers couldn't really figure out a way to naturally insert this mechanic into the game, so you barely ever even see this power-up, but we'll get to that later. It also added in a general feeling of soulless dread that you would hope to never be in a Mario game, but here we are. And New Super Mario Bros. U added an interconnected world, like for Mario World, with the worlds being given food-type names, like Mario World. They kept in the Koopalings and the four-player co-op, and added back in the mid-boss Boom Boom for Mario 3. And lastly, it added the new power-up, the Squirrel Suit, which, personally I love this power-up, but it really is just another form of flying and or hovering. So overall, if you cannot tell, the problem here is that even with the ways that the games tried to differ from one another, they couldn't help but continue to cannibalize themselves with returning ideas, and when they did come up with brand new ideas, that didn't mean that they were very good or particularly original ideas. And again, as I just mentioned, these games would not only cannibalize old games of the Mario series, but they would also cannibalize each other as they would share the same general aesthetics story, music, tile sets, models, and even level concepts. So it gets really hard to distinguish one from another, and that is not how a Mario game should be. I know we came into this video meaning to talk about the magic and whimsy of the Mario series, but, well, I guess I felt Mario and the quest for safe, stagnant, and immediate brand recognition wasn't the most appealing of video titles. Though, don't get me wrong, there certainly is fun to be had in these games. New Super Mario Bros. DS obviously gets easy points for just existing since it was the first 2D Mario game in so long. It took some cues from Mario 3 and had you going through eight distinctly themed worlds, each with mid-fortresses, with a boss that was always a complete joke, and an end castle with the boss. The game actually also took a couple cues from the 3D Mario games as well, adding in moves like wall jumping and triple jumps into Mario's moveset. Since this first game didn't bring back the Koopalings, the bosses seem strange now to look back on. They were unique, and yet, very forgettable. I'm glad they tried for something different, but none of them really stood on their own ground to be particularly memorable, considering they were all essentially just bigger versions of normal Mario enemies. Oh, and PD Prana was here too for Mario Sunshine for some reason. I never remember that this tank boss exists. Haha, <laughs> isn't it cute that they brought back the Bowser Bridge for Mario 1 in this game, and then they brought it back again later in the game, and then they brought it back again even later in the game? <laughs> It's adorable, because I get that reference. I see what they did there. Not coming up with a new Bowser fight and just rehashing the very first one ever. <laughs> get used to seeing this. Although they did do one of the most metal things Mario has ever done to date. 
having Bowser's flesh completely melt off of his bones after getting dropped into the lava, thus creating Dry Bowser, who would go on to be a playable spin-off character in many a Mario spin-off games. There's a few new power-ups here, being the Mega Mushroom, Mini Mushroom, and Blue Shell. None of them particularly scream memorable Mario power-ups. It's always, oh my god, I forgot this game had this, rather than, oh man, why doesn't Nintendo ever bring back the Blue Shell? Probably because it was a highly contextual power-up, only good for getting into a couple secrets in the game, was hard to handle because every time you ran you would start spinning into the shell, which would have you bouncing off into different directions into walls, and the fact that even in a level specifically designed for the blue shell, it still feels completely unwieldy and not fun. Even though I loved it as a kid, but that's just because it was blue and my mind is simple like that. I like blue. The Mega Mushroom was the big marketing gimmick of the game. I didn't mean for that to be a pun. However, this power-up was also very contextual, but even moreover, dull. You would get it every now and again, you'd turn big, you'd run into things for a few seconds, instantly destroying everything in your path, and then it would be over. You can't really design the level around something like this since you just smash into it and break everything anyway, so of course it only lasts a few seconds, but it amounts to nothing more than a brief dopamine rush of destruction, and it doesn't really add much to the game other than, hey, buy the game, it's different because it's got a big mushroom. The mini mushroom had the most utility of the new power-ups, which is probably why it's the only one that appears in all four of the new Super Mario Bros. games. Not like he had much tough competition here with that. It makes Mario incredibly small, naturally, and your jumps would be extremely floaty. You bounce off enemies' heads and would have to ground pound to even damage anything. You could run on water, and you could go into mini pipes that any other type of Mario would be too big to get into. You would also need this power up in order to unlock worlds 4 and 7, unless you unlock world 7 via a warp cannon, but I digress. These worlds would be skipped normally, unless you beat the World 2 and World 5 bosses while being Mini Mario, which was always very stressful due to the floaty jump and instant death nature of the power-up. So in short, while this power-up had the most use out of the three new power-ups, and would go on to be in the rest of the new Super Mario Bros. games, it always felt like a power down than a power-up, one necessary for various secrets in the game. It's not fun. <laughs> This game would also set the precedent for all the new Super Mario Bros. games that each and every level would have three collectible star coins. The use for these star coins being slightly different among the games. In this game, you would use them to buy access to mushroom houses which would help you out with power-ups and one-ups. Or when you beat the game, you're able to buy different skins for the bottom screen. The star coins themselves in the first game are incredibly easy to find. Honestly, most of them are just in plain sight, not even trying to hide from the player in any fun or unique way. Thankfully, they get better about this after the DS title. After the credits of this game, you're also given a cheat code that unlocks the ability to play as Luigi. He doesn't play any differently at all, but it feels like a fun reward for the player. This code can be used from the beginning of a brand new file as well. This would set a theme for future Mario titles, of using the ability to play as Luigi as a special reward for the player. Giving Luigi a certain sort of appeal of making him feel special whenever we unlock him in our Mario adventures. This DS title is also home of Mario's ugliest enemy design of all time. These guys only appear in this game and only in two levels in World 5. Let's bring up a small picture of him. Thanks to the low resolution of the DS graphics, it's really hard to tell, but we'll try to deduce what we're looking at from here. There's, uh, he, um, he's got yellowish skin, brownish red eyes, green boots that make it look like he doesn't have legs, a horn, like a unicorn, I guess. And what I want to say looks like a barrel on top of his head that he's wearing. It's what I see at least. I'm not... What is this enemy design? For years, I have always been confused by this thing. That is, until now. Why don't we look at a high-res version of this guy, hmm? First thing to notice is that it's not a barrel on his head. It's a shell. Secondly, it has just the biggest lips you could imagine. What in God's green earth is this thing? 
And uh, it's called a snail corn. Okay. Uh, hmm. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. Well, don't I feel like a tool for making fun of it now? It's just a strange grab bag of ideas that, in combination with each other, don't really make sense to me. It also doesn't make sense to me why he's exclusive to ice levels. What about this makes him ice themed? It's hard to believe we never see him return in any other Mario games, huh? At the end of the day, New Super Mario Bros. DS has the simplest level design and was made for anyone of any skill level to be able to pick up and play. Due to that, and it being a DS game that doesn't have as much polish as the games after it, you would think I would find this one to be the most underwhelming of the series. But you'd be wrong. We'll get to that in a few minutes though. But first, New Super Mario Bros. Wii. New Mario Wii is essentially more of the same as the DS game while adding in multiplayer and looking nicer? The level design is overall much better than what we had seen with New Super Mario Bros. DS, and the star coins are actually somewhat hidden usually, being in secrets or hidden passageways in the levels, as this would be the first New Super Mario Bros. game to utilize the ability to go into hidden walls. The levels, while having tighter designs, do have a lot more open space, typically with a zoomed out camera to accommodate the possibility of four players on screen at once. In single player, this can sometimes make things feel a bit empty or off. This game did add Yoshi though, in like 6 out of the 77 levels, and you can't take him out of the levels he appears in. Which is better than what Mario 3 did for the Goomba Shoe, but kinda makes you wonder why Yoshi was something they marketed the game with if he's barely in the game at all. This game was on the Wii, so Nintendo of course added WAGGLE! Waggling the Wiimote's mid-air would allow Mario to spin. This would give the player extra distance. It was a very helpful mechanic to use to elongate some of our jumps just enough to correct mistakes. As I've mentioned before, this game adds the Ice Flower. Yes, the Ice Flower. It took them nearly a quarter century after the creation of the Fire Flower. They finally made an Ice Flower. It allows Mario to throw an ice ball that can bounce only once off the ground, but can freeze enemies. Mario can then use these enemies as platforms or throw them into each other. The penguin suit is just the ice flower, but with the additions of making Mario swim really fast in water or slide on your belly when you're on land. It also makes you 35% cuter than usual. Honestly, this is what the frog suit for Mario 3 should have been. Fast mobility in water while also having more application for when you're out of the water. All the while, it doesn't completely butcher your movement speed or control when you're on land. Though, this does make the Ice Flower feel obsolete as soon as the player is acquainted with a penguin suit, since it's just a superior, more adorable version of the Ice Flower. After beating the game, you unlock World 9, which is a bonus world with challenging levels that can only be unlocked once you collect all the star coins in the other 8 worlds. This acts as the main incentive to collect star coins in this game, which Personally, I greatly prefer over having a different picture for the bottom screen that you hardly ever look at. When the game came out, this world felt special because we haven't seen a bonus world like this since Mario World from 1991. There's a little extra bit of magic the game has if you collect 99 lives, which is really easy to do. And that little bit of extra magic is Mario loses his hat. No reason for it, but it's nice, and again, I like pointless polish like this. So overall, New Super Mario Bros. Wii is pretty good. It introduced new gameplay elements and polished up the first New Super Mario Bros. game. Not much else to say about it. If we stopped here, it would be pretty solid. But we don't stop here. We don't. New Super Mario Bros. 2 is the most fine out of the bunch. There's not really much of note about it. New Super Mario Bros. Wii and New Super Mario Bros. U both brought at least their own style and feel to the mix that, while similar to New Super Mario Bros. DS, at least wasn't taking what the original DS title did and deciding to do just that again, like they did with New Super Mario Bros. 2. I'm starting to realize name dropping four similarly named games in a single sentence like this may be a bit confusing. The game had been developed at the same time as New Super Mario Bros. U, and the two games were even released mere months apart from each other. In order to make sure that they had enough staff to work on two 2D Mario games at the same time, Nintendo had gone through an experiment they dubbed the Mario Cram School, a program that took many people 
whom were inexperienced with designing 2D Mario games, from numerous studios within the company to come together to learn how to design proper Mario levels. Both of these games would go on to have people who had just recently learned how to design Mario levels. However, New Super Mario Bros. U would go on to have more veteran, experienced staff than New Super Mario Bros. 2. Yeah, I can see that. That makes sense. The supposed big new mechanic of New Super Mario Bros. 2 was the Golden Fire Flower, which first appears in World 2 and is rarely ever seen in levels after that. You also lose this ability after you beat a level with it, so you will hardly ever be using it. Probably because there's not really much you can do with it. It can feel satisfying to have, but once you have it, you're just eliminating everything in your way. Defeating enemies and turning blocks in your way into coins. And that's it. It's not something that can complement current Mario level design. And dare I say, you can't really make interesting level design based around it, period. Because you're too unstoppable. A random positive thing to note with this game is that it really likes using snake blocks. Previously, these blocks were mostly just used in castles and had entire levels based around them, these levels effectively being auto-scrollers and that you had to go through the level at the pace of the snake block movements rather than the pace that you would want to go at. But in New Super Mario Bros. 2, it would just use this concept in any random level it wanted. Not as the main mechanic of the level, but just as one particular sort of obstacle. Auto-scrollers are always tedious in Mario games. Snake block castles not being excluded from that. So it is nice to see that the game was able to find new uses of this mechanic in different ways other than just auto-scrolling levels. Alright, now something negative again. But this point isn't about something negative that the new Super Mario Bros. 2 team did do, but it's something that they didn't do. And they didn't do a lot, but he just, just hear me out here. Something I completely forgot about until I replayed the game. Once you beat the game and the credits play, you're in control of Mario as he's carrying Princess Peach. If they're going to go to the trouble of modeling a playable Mario holding Peach, why didn't they base a gameplay scenario around this? Imagine for a moment, you press down on the button that drops Bowser into the lake of fire, but as the bridge collapses and he falls into the lava, Mario realizes the whole castle is crumbling down as well. So then, Mario must grab Peach and make a quick escape from the castle before it collapses on top of them both. They could have designed a whole new gauntlet where Mario, instead of starting at the left and moving to the right to get to Peach, Mario must now go through a differently designed level that has him starting all the way on the right and has him escaping from the level by going left. Not only would this whole scenario feel different, giving the climax of the game something to remember it by, but it would also feel almost unnatural since we would be having Mario escaping Bowser's castle in the opposite direction than we've been going the entire rest of the game to get to Bowser's castle. You could even add in little extra details like not being able to wall jump since you're carrying Peach. And at the very end of the escape sequence, have Dry Bowser show up trying to stop Mario from being able to escape. A scenario like that would have made for a really exciting ending, instead of just Bowser Bridge, again, Big Bowser, again, okay you win. Okay, um, another positive, positive, new Smile Brothers 2, positive, Well I can say one of the best things that came out of new Super Mario Brothers 2 were the Bone Goomba and Bone Piranha Plant designs. While not particularly original ideas, they still look really cool because I just like dead things apparently since Dry Bowser was also cool. Wait, how does a plant have bones? This game also has an equivalent to World 9 after you beat Bowser, that being Star World, where you use star coins to buy access to new levels. Are you excited? No? Good. We'll be getting to that topic in a few minutes. This game was designed from the start with one goal in mind. Collecting coins, obviously. But the idea the director of the game wanted was to have the player be able to reach a total of 1 million coins. An idea that even bled into the marketing of the game. However, after playing through the finished campaign of the game, he realized that the player would be nowhere near a million coins. His answer to fix this being the all new coin rush mode. In this, you'll pick a pack of levels from Mushroom Pack, Flower Pack, or Star Pack, each ranging in difficulty, and you'll be given three levels from the main campaign of the game. Your timer is cut short, so your objective in these packs is to collect extra time as you speed through the levels. Players are able to collect even more coins than normal in the Coin Rush version of these stages. 
including a times two coin multiplier if they get to the top of the flagpole. If you're able to get enough coins, you can reach the max limit of 30,000 coins before you've raced to the end of all three stages. But if you die even once during those three courses, you get sent all the way back to the start of the first course. So while you want to get through these levels as fast as possible while gaining as many coins as possible, you will also have to be careful at the same time. Sadly, I feel like they didn't go as far as they could have with this mode. They should have added bonus objectives for you to try to go for, things that add to your coin counter after you've beaten all of three stages in the course pack, such as beating the course under a certain time, perhaps a coin multiplier if you do so while also managing to get all the star coins in all three levels, or more bonus coins if you beat all three levels without getting hit, or without getting any power-ups. Things like this would have added even more replay value to playing these level packs over and over. Regardless, in theory, this mode is still fine as is. In theory. But all of this hinges on the fact that the reward for getting 1 million coins is something that the player will want to do, meaning that the reward is worth it. Especially when, even if you replay these courses over and over and over, it will still take a lot of grinding in order to get 1 million coins. So finally, drumroll please. The reveal of what you get after your coin counter reaches 1 million coins. A slightly different title screen. Nothing to change up the gameplay. No new levels or worlds. No new playable character. Nothing to change the presentation of the game a la Mario World's Autumn Incarnation. Just slightly different title screen. Oh, well if you get nearly 10 times that amount and get 9,099,999 coins, you get an even different -er title screen. Amazing. <sighs> Collecting coins in this game about coins, it's not worth it. It's really not worth it. Maybe there should have been some sort of shop during the campaign where you could buy access to more power-ups or new levels so it would feel more justified that they're pushing all these coins at you. But no, none of this. Nothing worthwhile. Nothing. In short, this mode can feel satisfying for a few brief moments as you're running through courses, raking up thousands and thousands of coins in such short bursts. But after those few short bursts of dopamine, it just gives you this dead, empty sensation. After playing the mode a couple times, you realize there's no real point in playing it at all. And it's not even particularly fun to play. Which is just sad. But we're not done talking about Coin Rush. Because this game has DLC, where it adds brand new level packs to Coin Rush. They're not very good. There are 10 packs, and most of them try to have some sort of theme to them. Allow me to go over some of them with you, but not all of them because it is not worth our precious time. The Gold Rush pack is easy and just throws a bunch of chances to play around with the Gold Fire Flower for once. The Nerve Rack pack has some rather dull levels, two of which heavily involve consecutively jumping off of enemies, which always comes off as boring and lazy level design. Gold Classics pack, which takes level designs from Mario games like 1 and 3, but remixes them so you can explore them in different ways. Not the most exciting thing, but it was nice that this DLC was free when it first came out. For about 3 months, but then it was full price again. Platform Panic Pack has levels based around waiting on platforms and are all effectively auto-scrolling levels, which is really fun when you're paying for levels that are just auto-scrollers. Mystery Adventures Pack, which is certainly one of the better ones as they have more open-ended levels that would probably be more fun to go through if they weren't in this coin rush mode. The second level of this pack is still really lame though. The Impossible Pack, which is meant to be frustrating even for Mario veterans. Please note that you'll only get around 100 coins for completing this pack, if that, due to there being not a single collectible coin in any of its three levels. That's pretty cool that they made this for a mode that revolves around getting as many coins as possible. The real reason this pack is here is to test your patience. They really abuse the player with the mechanic where if you die once, you have to start the entire level pack all over. The first level alone is enough to make me want to rip my hair out. It starts off with a water section, with a jumping pufferfish and purple spikefish that follow after you, 
and a big purple fish that can swallow you, killing you instantly. That's all fairly easy though, but the section of level following after that has you going up into the sky. Going over an instant death pit on a paddle wheel you have to continuously jump on to keep moving forward, all the while crows fly down at you, bob bombs rain down on you, and a couple lakitus harass you. And then finally, a section with hard to predict hammer brothers and chain chomps. The second level has a lot of wall jumps, moving platforms, and fire bars. Third level has grinders, note blocks, and instant death poison. Unfortunately, I don't think the gameplay being shown here accurately illustrates how difficult these stages are, due to this person taking several days out of their life and over a couple hundred attempts to finally learn how to properly get through these levels. But I think that that explanation of how long it took them to get through these levels that amount to 5 minutes of gameplay is enough for you to probably understand. You're not even allowed to use your golden fire flower that they give you at the start of every coin rush pack. Talk about fun! I'm glad I paid for this! I usually like when Nintendo throws in really difficult courses in Mario games because it feels like a fun challenge that contrasts how easy Mario games usually are. But this... This is not fun. It wouldn't be as bad if you didn't have to go all the way back to the first stage every time you made a simple mistake in the third stage and died instantly to poison. So in short, these levels aren't fun. And neither really are the other levels, but for other reasons. Most of the other stages aren't very noteworthy. And there are even some really dull, boring levels. But I can't be all negative though, can I? Let's look at some highlights of what I did like from these DLC courses to help justify that I spent money on them. Course 3 of Gold Mushroom Pack is an underground level that's completely vertical, which is something that has not been done in a new Super Mario Bros. game before. Level itself isn't particularly special though, just reusing a couple mushroom platform based gimmicks we've seen a few times. Um, Course 3 from Gold Rush Pack. Using a golden fire flower you can hit brick blocks in the walls to get coins, which is an, it's an idea that wasn't seen in the main game, so... Mm -hmm. Course 2 of Coin Challenge Pack C has a star coin that's chopped by a bunch of brick blocks that all have coins in it. The only way to get to it is by hitting the ones at the bottom quickly enough to turn it into a golden block that Mario can put his head in. Not getting enough coins from the block in time will make it so you're simply unable to get the coin. It may not seem like much, but it's a decent puzzle for a star coin like this. I'm really stretching for positives, aren't I? The second part of Course 1 of Mystery Adventures Pack is pretty fun. It's a level that feels almost like you're going through a tomb, and this part of the level in particular has a lot of branching paths, with walls that open for you if you defeat enemies, so there's quite a bit to explore. It's just a shame that, since it's in Coin Rush, there's a time limit, so you're not really able to explore to your heart's content. And, um... None of that sounded particularly positive, but that's all I got. Each of these packs are... In American dollars, two dollars and fifty cents. So if you were to pay for all ten of these packs, that would equate to twenty-five U.S. dollars. Twenty-five U.S. dollars. Over half of what this game costed when it first released. Twenty-five dollars for thirty levels. The quality of those thirty levels having a big range to them. That price is rather steep, and I can safely say is certainly not worth it. As the avid Mario fan I am, I hadn't even touched most of these DLCs up until recently. I ended up buying the remaining ones I hadn't bought yet, just so I can play them for this video. I knew they weren't worth it without even playing them, in my opinion after having finally experienced them for myself, has not changed at all. A disappointing display for DLC in a Nintendo game. Not the most offensive they've done to date, but disappointing nevertheless. Even after all that, I would understand if someone said to me New Super Mario Bros. 2 was better than their DS title. Honestly, I give New Super Mario Bros. DS quite a bit of leeway for being the first in the series. But New Super Mario Bros. 2 really doesn't bring anything worthwhile to the formula, making it feel very vapid, especially with the reusing of assets from New Super Mario Bros. Wii. It's easy to point to this game and say it's the pinnacle of disappointment in modern Mario games, as it lacks a lot of heart. But if it's the one New Super Mario Bros. game you play, you're not gonna have a bad time. New Super Mario Bros. U is the fourth, and by god, hopefully the last, New Super Mario Bros. game. It's a game that has the feeling of, here we go again, and yet manages to stand above the rest thanks to its superior level design. 
And if the player starts feeling fatigue from going through all the levels, which I'm sure you will, they can take a break and play the brand new challenge mode. There's multiple types of challenges, from getting to the goal in a certain amount of time, getting to the goal without touching the ground, surviving for a certain amount of time, or getting a certain amount of 1-ups. It feels refreshing to throw yourself into a few challenges every now and again, and it can be surprisingly difficult in order to get a gold medal on many of them. What do you get for completing all of these challenges? Nothing, but they're still fun to do for a few minutes at a time. But at least they don't promise something amazing happens if you complete them all and then after you do it, it's just a title screen, so you know... Uh, never forgive. Time to say this again. Um, after you defeat Bowser, you unlock a special world, where you use star coins to unlock access to extra levels. Are you excited? Still no? Good. It's good for Mario games to have post-game content like this with secret levels and worlds. However, by this game, we can clearly notice that these games have been missing the point of this. It was exciting to see in New Super Mario Bros. Wii, because we hadn't seen a secret world like this appear after we defeat the last boss like that. And we haven't seen a world like that, period, since Mario World. But now that this has happened for a third time in a row, rather than feeling exciting and magical, now it just feels formulaic. Formulaic not being a word that can be associated with magical. And you might think, after the Mario franchise is over 30 years old, it's impossible to have any surprises left. But you'd be wrong, because just a couple years after New Super Mario Bros. U, we'd have a Mario game that had a secret world unlock after you beat the last boss, which after you beat the second level of this extra world, you unlock a brand new character to play as, and once you beat that world, you unlock two new worlds after that, and after you beat those worlds and get every collectible in the game, you unlock one last world, which houses two less challenges. So no, I wouldn't say it's impossible for Mario games to surprise us with these types of extras, but I would just say it might take a little more effort and thought than none at all. This game, like New Super Mario Bros. 2, also got DLC, that being a whole new campaign called New Super Luigi U. As one might imagine, this game came out during the year of Luigi, and had Mario removed as a playable character. In New Super Luigi U, you'll go across the exact same overworld as New Super Mario Bros. U, but the levels are all brand spankin' new, and made to be more challenging. A healthy, fun sort of challenge, rather than frustrating and unfair. Each of these levels are roughly half the length of a typical New Super Mario Bros. U level, the catch here is that you're only given 100 seconds at the beginning of the stage to get to the end. And you have to play with Luigi's signature slippery controls and higher jump. The Luigi controls may take a few levels to get used to, but having these challenging levels designed with this style of play in mind feels rewarding and fun to play through. The world themes are all exactly the same, but thankfully have brand new tile sets and background set pieces to make them feel different enough. Unlike New Super Mario Bros. 2 DLC, the levels themselves also have the same mechanics as seen in New Super Mario Bros. U, but are mixed and matched or utilized differently than we've ever seen them before, so the level designs are able to still feel fresh. Cute little easter egg, each level has its own hidden Luigi. Some are easier to find than others, and some are more unique than others, such as a bunch of them are just random Luigi sprites. Or sometimes, you know, Luigi can just be the sky. It's almost reminiscent of Hidden Mickeys in Disney World, but I don't like Disney. Honestly, with these more difficult, shorter stages making the game have a much snappier pace, I wouldn't blame anyone if they said that this was their favorite new Super Mario Bros. game. Which would be ironic, because Mario's not in it. Keeping in mind that the main game of New Super Mario Bros. U was $60, and with this DLC you're doubling the amount of levels, guess the price of this DLC. $20. Or if you want the physical version, $30. $20! For 83 brand new levels. For less than the cost of New Super Mario Bros. 2 DLC, you get significantly more content, with much more consistent quality level design. That is how you do DLC. A significant amount of worthwhile content at a fair price. It's not that complicated. I'm not sure what's so hard to understand here. The only negatives I would have for New Super Luigi U being that it's kind of annoying to hear the game's hurry up music it always does whenever the timer gets below 100. 
for every stage. And, uh, second negative, there's absolutely no indication that you have to pound ground right here to find a pipe to launch you to a secret exit. No indication. Every other secret exit in a Mario game is supposed to have an indication to help you find it, to help you look for where a secret exit would be. But here, you just randomly pound ground the ground for no reason. You're supposed to know this. Sorry, it's just... It's always bothered me. In 2018, Nintendo re-released New Super Mario Bros. U as New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. Very many school changes aside, it's the same exact game as the Wii U game, but with the Luigi DLC added as well. With this re-release, someone at Nintendo thought it would be a brilliant idea to make it so that in order to do the spin jump for extra distance, you would hit the jump button twice. In New Super Mario Bros. U on the Wii U, if you were to play on the gamepad, you would hit the shoulder button, which worked. This was fantastic, since you didn't have to do the waggle thing, and it was just an easy, convenient button. But here, they tie it to the shoulder button as well, but also to the jump button if you hit it twice. This would be a problem, because it feels absolutely unnatural to how we use this mechanic in every other game that has this mechanic. And it's a problem because when you're in a squirrel suit and you want to glide midair, you are forced to do a spin before you're allowed to do the glide that you wanted to do. This all resulted in uncomfortable gameplay and needless deaths. But, and this is a big but, you can change the controls to make it so you can just press the shoulder button in order to do the spin action rather than tapping jump button twice. How do you do this, you may ask? Mayhaps it is in an options or control menu that you can turn on or off. And to that, I scoff. No, in order to make the game comfortable to play, you must input a secret code, one that the game does not tell you about. On the main title screen of the game, you must press down on the left analog for three seconds before hitting L and R. And that's how you make the game fun to play. The most out there, random input just to make the game feel right to play. After doing this, your controls are as they should. But here I say again, but you must input this cheat code every time you boot up the game. The controls always reset back to their default after the game is closed. Nintendo, the ones usually at the forefront of innovation and creativity, just can't help themselves to go one step forward, five steps back every now and again, for no reason. <laughs> Aside from this terrible, stupid, idiotic idea with the re-release, this has to be my favorite of the new Super Mario Brothers series or at least of the new Super Mario Brothers games that were officially released by Nintendo themselves. But maybe that's for another video. Looking back, I really didn't say too much about the main game of new Super Mario Brothers U, but I guess that's just because after this being the fourth game, I think you get it. There's not much of note to say that I haven't said about the other games. Oh, wait, I forgot about that one level. Ah yes, that level. The best set piece has got to be the Starry Night themed background in one of the ghost levels. It is mesmerizing and honestly wouldn't mind if the whole game had a similar art style like this. Da Vinci will be proud. Or Rembrandt. I don't know. It doesn't help that some levels, like a spectacular piece focusing on Van Gogh's Starry Night, are so stunning you start to wonder why that same creativity wasn't applied to the entire product. Personally, I thought it would have been cool if they made an entire world of levels inspired by different artists, but this was still a cool idea. My favorite level, in terms of visuals, and I'm sure a lot of you will agree, is the level where the background looks like it was painted by Van Gogh. This is seriously the best looking level in a Mario game that I've seen in a very long time. Now yes, there is that one level that looks like a painting, probably the best level in the game. It's clean, it's crisp, and most importantly, imaginative. I mean, look at this. All right, I think you get it, but it's been said so many times because it's true. The new Super Mario Brothers games were designed from the start to appeal to gamers who had played the old Mario games when they were younger, but had dropped off of playing games after the transition to 3D gaming. They were a series of games made to appeal to both casual and hardcore fans of games. They did their job 
but lack their own sort of magic that we love Mario games for having. They're a series of games that I mostly enjoyed when they came out, only to learn to resent them and what they stood for. Thankfully, now that I know Nintendo is willing to do different things with Mario again, I feel as if I'm able to enjoy these games again for what they are, for the most part. I can see these games being a bit like comfort food. They're not the best, and they're not the best for you, but you know what you're getting into, and it's polished, and nevertheless, it's simple fun. When these games first came out, people started growing bored of the stagnation that came with them. And probably because of the fact that half of them came out months apart from each other, that certainly didn't help. At the time, Nintendo needed something new. ACTUALLY NEW in order to help bring life back to the 2D Mario games. Super Mario Maker! Where do we go from here, one may ask. Our plumber has already rejuvenated North American interest in video games, defined a whole genre, created numerous revolutionary games that still resonate and inspire people to this very day. He's gone through too many adventures to keep up with, so how else can we move forward without it again feeling like we're treading water? Level Editor! Since the dawn of the internet, people have been tampering with ROM hacking or making their own fan games in order to create their own Mario levels, to bring their own imagination to the Mushroom Kingdom, for better or worse. Many of these fan games would also boast the ability for players to easily create their own levels as well, without having to do any of that pesky coding themselves. For years, we've had to rely on these fan-made creations in order to enjoy fan-created Mario levels. But in 2015, this was no more, as Nintendo did what we thought they'd never do. Nintendo said to the fans, Oh, New Super Mario Bros. is too boring for you all? Well, you know. Nintendo was like, why are we spending money making levels for consumers when consumers will give us money to make the levels themselves? And that's what Super Mario Maker is. It's a great big brightly colored smile through clenched teeth and a cheerful cry of, well, if you're so clever, you can do it. Super Mario Maker. They're like, okay, we're tired right now. We've earned this rest, goddammit. You guys make your own damn game. I just imagine Miyamoto is sitting in his office like, oh, what, you don't like our games all of a sudden? Well, make one your own damn self. If you're so good, make it your s- Oh, forget it. Nintendo made the dream come alive. What countless Mario fans fantasize about, being able to craft their own Mario creations in an official Mario level creation tool. One that boasts four types of games. Super Mario Bros. 1, 3, World, and New Super Mario Bros. U. One that brings back features, power-ups, and enemies from the old games but also adds in brand new and unique mechanics, while tweaking some old ones in order for them to interact with one another in a more open, creative environment. All this so we, the fans, could enjoy crafting our very own levels for the entire world to play, and these are pretty bad, actually. Wow, wow. all right, that doesn't even look like fun. Why would I want to purposely frustrate myself with levels like these? Oh, yeah. They're for YouTubers and streamers to play so that they can yell and get a lot of views. ARE YOU SERIOUS?! Oh boy, look at all these levels that just play themselves. Isn't this fun? Right? That's what this is supposed to be fun? Fun. As cynical as I'm being, not all the levels were bad or completely, utterly unfun. Just most of them. And finding a diamond in the rough was no easy feat with you having to look through highest rated levels that were still not always very good. It didn't help that you couldn't search for any particular type of level that you might have wanted. You could only search for levels if you had their very specific level ID, which didn't make finding levels the most intuitive thing in the world, sadly. But what was intuitive was the level creation itself. The Wii U pad with its touchscreen and stylus was made to work perfectly for a game like this. Just plop down some ground, click on the drop down menu to put in objects like items and obstacles, and in no time you would have had created a level. It couldn't be more intuitive. You can hand this over to a small child and I feel within a few minutes they would start to understand how it all works. It's just that easy. I cannot say enough how cool it is to see things like wigglers and chain chomps in Mario 1, or the ghost house theme in Mario 3. Assets that never existed before in these games, but were designed specifically for Mario Maker, as if they came from an alternate universe version of those games. 
perhaps people who have played the old games have already taken notice by now, but in the old Mario styles, you can notice that everything has a drop shadow to them. I like to think that this subtle detail is Nintendo's way of trying to justify this sort of game's existence, in that, like how Mario 3 was originally a stage play, these drop shadows give the feeling that everything is just a construct, just another play of sorts. As if to give the illusion that there are theater lights shining down on everything, and that the background is immediately by your side. Not everyone might like these backdrops, but this point of view has me appreciate this small little detail. Exclusive to the Mario 1 style is an item known as the Mystery Mushroom. It's this game's tie-in with Amiibo. Yeah, remember when those existed? With this item, you'd be able to transform Mario into over 150 other characters, which include other Mario characters, like Rosalina, or various Zelda characters, or Baby Metal, from the heavy metal J-pop band Baby Metal. Sure, w uh, why not? And who could forget Smash Player's favorite characters, from Fire and Mo This was a very clever idea for an item, not only because it gave you a reason to perhaps go out and buy amiibos, but also because these costumes helped inspire countless different levels from people. People making Zelda-esque dungeon levels with Link costumes, or levels meant to emulate the Green Hill Zone as you play as Sonic. These costumes may not have their own abilities attached to them, but they really open the door for people's creative ideas to flow. The one downside to this item is that it's only available in the Mario 1 style, so you can count on there being a large amount of Mario 1 styled levels because people want to use these costumes. If you don't want to go out and spend countless dollars for dozens of amiibos, or if you don't want to create your own NFC cards to pirate your own amiibo, you can instead unlock them by playing the 100 Mario Challenge. In this mode, you are given 100 lives to get through a series of user-submitted levels, and if you get to the end, you unlock a new amiibo costume. Most of these levels that you'll be playing are terrible which make this mode, and the grind to try to get these amiibo costumes, not fun. So yeah, guess it's back to creating my own NFC cards then. When in doubt, pirate things. <clears throat> Out of the box, Mario Maker had dozens of sample levels to show you what the level editor is capable of. And these levels, at large, are insanely boring. Usually these levels are only interested in showing the player one or two basic concepts for two seconds before they end. You would be hard pressed to call some of these levels at all. Which, you can argue that these levels are only meant to give you an idea of what is possible for you to do and then try to inspire you to further these concepts. But it's hard to feel inspired by a single boo wheel. And that's, that's it, that's the whole level. But that's me talking about the Wii U Mario Maker. Mario Maker on the 3DS, on the other hand, because this game exists, even though you all forget about it. Hoo boy! Again, out of the box, you have dozens of sample stages, but this time, they're actual stages. Also, they each have two challenges you can complete to get medals, which, if you get enough by the end, you unlock a few extra levels. Some of these levels are fun in their own right to play, but a few of them are really only engaging enough if you play along with the challenge medals. Allow me to best illustrate to you the differences between the Wii U sample levels and the 3DS sample levels. In the Wii U version, there's a sample course that has you trying to find a star to defeat a tower of chain chomps. And that's the end of the level. After you get past the tower, that's it. The 3DS version has this exact same puzzle as well, however, there's a whole level before you even get to this puzzle, one with an overworld and underground section. One of these took time and thought to make, and was fun to play. The other took two minutes, and takes five seconds to beat. I'll let you ponder which one's which. The 3DS levels are actual levels, and if you want a real Mario campaign, you can play this and actually feel fairly satisfied by it. If you love Mario games and haven't played the 3DS Mario Maker because you thought there wasn't any point in doing so, like how I had previously thought, I recommend playing it for the single player alone. For $20 or less, I feel that's pretty fair. But don't get it for any other reason than the single player. In the 3DS version, you cannot upload levels. You can only play certain levels that Nintendo has deemed worthy, and there are no amiibo costumes. And you can't even make courses on the 3DS version and then send them to your Wii U game to save, play, and then upload from there. 
which feels like a huge missed opportunity. I mean, I get it, the Wii was dead and the whole reason they ported it to the 3DS was to try to rake in some extra cash so they wouldn't really have cared to try to support something they knew wouldn't have been worth it in the end. But it just feels ridiculous that you can play co-op on a 3DS version of Monster Hunter Try with a friend who is playing on the Wii U version of the game, but Nintendo didn't make it so you can transfer just a small amount of information between the two Mario Maker versions. Also, the graphics for the New Super Mario Bros. U style looks considerably worse than New Super Mario Bros. 2. And there's lag in levels if you have a lot going on, like coins. So yeah, only get this if you're interested in some official levels. But now that we've talked about the original Mario Makers, it's time to finally talk about the game Switch owners were waiting years for, Super Mario Maker 2. In this game, we have more level themes, more enemies, more types of objects and blocks, an all new Mario 3D world style, slopes, more convenience in trying to find the types of levels you want to play, and finally, no mystery amiibo mushroom. Ah. Oh. But they did eventually add the Master Sword item into Mario 1, which is effectively just a Link costume, but now he has unique abilities that you can design levels around. Abilities that he would have in Zelda games like Pegasus boots, bombs, arrows, and stabbing. More importantly for me though, is that they learned something from Mario Maker on the 3DS. That of which being, Mario Maker should have a proper story mode. And that's exactly what we got! We play through over a hundred officially designed levels. In the levels, you're trying to collect as many coins as possible in order to rebuild Peach's castle. The more coins you get, the more you can rebuild. The more you rebuild, the more levels you unlock. With this, they've miraculously found a proper use for coins. Finally. However, other than playing levels over and over in order to grind for post-game additions to the overworld, there is not much incentive to go back to levels to replay them. No extra challenge medals like the 3DS Mario Maker story mode. But the levels are more than worth going through at least once for its 5-6 hour story campaign. I also have to note that having our overworld be 3D like this, where you can freely walk around as opposed to a traditional overhead overworld where you're limited by certain paths, feels different and fresh. I would love to see another 2D Mario game try to explore what an overworld like this could be in the future. Almost like Ukulele in the Impossible Lair. There's plenty new to play around with in the level editor. For instance, the amount of themes can almost feel daunting at first. There are 10 themes to choose from compared to Mario Maker's 6. On top of that, each theme has a night version that switches up the mechanics of the level, such as low gravity, sandstorms, darkness, or turning the screen upside down. Don't do this one, please, it's not fun to play. You have new enemies like Spike, Pokey, Goombrats, Ant, and Koopa Car Koopa. You have new items like the on and off blocks, swing and claws, snake blocks, a red Yoshi that always spits fire, and a dry bone shell that lets you hop on spikes and ride across lava. The worst Mario power-up of all time returns for Mario Land, but that's okay because it's nostalgic now and you're able to use it for cute little puzzle levels. A brand new power-up is added, Builder Mario, who has a hammer. Sadly, no one seems to use it because it feels rather restrictive in what you can do with it. It ultimately doesn't help with the flow of a level either, because using it always has Mario stop in place for a moment. But it's the closest we'll get to having the hammer suit back for Mario 3, huh? But after all that, you also are able to add goal stipulations so that the player won't be able to finish a level without completing a certain task. Like collecting a certain amount of coins, or defeating a certain number of enemies, or not leaving the ground at all. All these things, and more, kick open the door to so many brand new possibilities for people's creativity to flow. Which is fantastic, because as of now, you are able to upload a hundred levels for the world to see and play. Which is a MASSIVE step up from the amount you could upload for Mario Maker 1. The way it worked in 1 was that you start with the ability to upload 10 levels, and from there you could unlock the ability to upload more by getting people to play and star your current levels. You would need 5,000 stars in order to upload 100 levels in Mario Maker 1, which would be a rather difficult thing to achieve, unless you get lucky with making a popular level. Or unless you were a YouTuber streamer and then you would get it automatically, really. The addition of 3D World as a new style is really cool, though 
it is a bit frustrating that this style is not compatible with other styles. What I mean by that is that when you're designing a level in any of the styles of Mario 1, 3, World, or U, you can change the game's style on the fly and continue editing your level. But if you're working on any one of those level styles and try to change the style to 3D World, or vice versa, the level just goes completely blank. This is more than likely because 3D World has actual 3D models, while the other four styles are all sprite-based, even New Super Mario Bros. U, making it easy for the engine to swap between them all, unless it comes to Mario 3D World. This makes it so you really have to be purposeful if you're making a stage in the 3D World style, because if you realize you want to change to a different style partway through, you're gonna have to remake your entire stage. Making levels on the Switch doesn't feel as good as it did on the Wii U. You have two options this time around. A standard controller, which involves using a rather cumbersome control scheme that may take some time to get used to, or using the touchscreen via handheld mode. You would think this would be close to how it felt to make levels back on the Wii U, but it's not quite there. As, unless you go out of your way to buy some accessory, the Switch doesn't have a stylus. So either way, you can get used to how it feels to create levels in Mario Maker 2, but it will act as an initial hurdle to get the feel for. Unless you're playing the story mode or are creating your own levels, most of your time is probably going to be spent playing on this screen, going between these five tabs. Hot courses, popular courses, new courses, detailed search, and star. Let's give a rundown of each of these tabs. First of all, popular courses. And like in Mario Maker 1, you'll find a number of unique, well-thought-out levels here. <sighs> but also like Mario Maker 1, after playing for a bit, you'll start noticing a pattern of common types of popular levels. During its height of popularity, Mario Maker 1's most popular levels were largely auto Marios. Levels where you would either press absolutely nothing at all, or levels where you would hold down right in the run button. These wouldn't be long or particularly fun, but they would give a brief spectacle. Things are different with Mario Maker 2's most popular courses, but only slightly. We still have some auto Marios, but more than them are courses that are known as speed run levels. This specific sort of level takes less than a minute to do, many of them only taking about 20 seconds. In them, you hold the right button and the run button and jump at strategic moments. At the very least, these levels have you actually inputting when to jump, so they're not completely mindless. And yet, after you play a dozen or so of these levels, they all start using the same ideas and surprises to where they quickly get dull as well. Another common type of level found in the popular courses are known as... Refreshing courses? They're levels specifically found in the 3D world theme that all look nearly identical to one another. They all start the same, all have a long vertical section where you pound ground through blocks, power-ups, and you see various explosions that instantly kill all sorts of enemies and bosses around you until you get to the bottom and collect so many coins that the game starts to lag. These levels usually have a Koopa car section that speeds through even more enemies, and then you win. These levels are the very definition of sensory overload, and I find them to be even more mind-numbing than the Auto Marios found in Mario Maker 1, somehow. They're all identical, and they all have the promise of making you feel refreshed and happy after a long, hard day as if watching a bunch of random flashing colors is going to reignite the flames in my empty heart after slaving away at my soul-destroying job. After playing different levels in the popular tag for so long, it starts to become grating how similar many of these sorts of levels are, to the point where my mind, by no exaggeration, starts going numb from playing them, which for a while made me want to actively avoid playing this game. As it goes to show, I guess these refreshing levels really did make me calm, because whatever could be calmer than being in a catatonic state. Next is new courses, which is just random new courses. And it's going to be hard to find anything worthwhile here, so don't bother. Then there's hot courses, which the quality of these levels tend to be better than the ones you would see in new, but there's still a lot of not good ones here, so you probably won't be spending much time in this tab. Here is what Mario Maker 1 
desperately needed, but we were finally given in Mario Maker 2. Tags. When you upload a level, you're given the ability to choose two tags that describe what your level is from a list. Not only does this give a player information about the levels, giving them the chance to judge if they would be interested in playing it without actually playing it, it allows people to do detailed searches by looking through the various tags. If in your heart of hearts, you want nothing more than to play a Super Mario World Sky themed level, then by god, here is an endless buffet of them. I do have an issue with the tag system in this game, however. Surprise, surprise, I can't be happy with anything, can I? This game gives you the ability to look for levels that have the tag or tags you desire. And not only does this heavily rely on the level creators being accurate in how they tag their levels, but the game does not give you the ability to exclude tags from your search. Let's say I'm in the mood for a more standard type of Mario level, so let's turn everything off except for, let's say, standard and no tags. Let's see what we get. And our search comes up, and there's plenty of speedrun levels here. That's not what I'm looking for. Okay, maybe we should be more lenient in what tags we want to find. Let's look up standard, short and sweet, themed, and none, and see what happens. Well, now I'm seeing puzzle solving and auto mario coming up as my top results. This isn't what I want. I do think searching for levels through tags is a pretty good way to find some decent ones, but ironically, you're still going to be getting plenty of stuff you're not asking for. If they just added the ability to exclude tags in your search, this would immediately be fixed. Lastly is the star tab. Mario Maker 2 gives you the ability to star level creators you enjoy. Whenever those creators post new levels, you'll be able to find them here. Think of this tab as your subscriptions tab from YouTube, which should have me in them, but for Mario levels instead. Finding level designers you enjoy and following them like this is one of the best ways to have new levels you'll more than likely enjoy. Though this of course hinges on them staying with the game and hopefully making more. To maybe get you started, here are a couple level creators I recommend. They're both fairly popular, but I feel the need to suggest them anyway. First is Matilda. Since day one of this game, she has proven to have a great grasp on not only proper level design, but also the inner workings of the Mario Maker engine, which make for fun and surprising levels. And the second creator I'll mention is Silentron, who may not have as good as a grasp on the fundamentals of a proper Mario level, but is still able to come up with some interesting and fun stuff. Check those two out, and hopefully you'll be able to find some of their levels to be as fun as I did. Outside of all those things we've talked about so far, there are a few other things to do here, like online multiplayer. This is a landmark event, since this is the first time 2D Mario has ever had online multiplayer, something people have been begging Nintendo to have in 2D Mario games since New Super Mario Bros. Wii back in 2009. It sucks. It's awful. It's not fun. There's horrible lag. The levels that are picked are rarely any good, and too often these levels aren't even designed with multiplayer in mind, so they become either harder to play because of it, or just impossible. The only reason to play this mode is to record footage, to then make a video about how it sucks. Similar to Mario Maker 1's 100 Mario Challenge is the new Endless Mode, which is just the same thing, but now it just goes on forever. Like Mario Maker 1, it's a crapshoot of what sort of levels you'll get, and too often the levels will just be downright awful. At least in Mario Maker 1, if you trudge through the grime, you'll get awarded with an amiibo costume that you can use in levels. Playing this Endless Mode though, you get, well, nothing, except for some clothing for your me which is far from worth anything, so I usually end up forgetting this mode exists. Now that I've done this great back and forth between the pros and cons of this game, it's now time for the real reason why I wanted to talk about Mario Maker 2. And that's for shameless self-promotion of two levels that I made that I'm really proud of. The first one here is called Sky Sanctuary Fortress. It's meant to be a challenging, but completely fair level that involves various mechanics like the swing crane and lava bubbles on tracks. It has a great focus on platforming, and was lightly inspired by Cave Story. And like Cave Story, if you're good enough, I designed the level to be easy to speedrun with different routes or various ways to shave off time. Admittedly, that level is a bit tough though, so the second level I designed is significantly easier. 
It's called The Dead Sea. It involves a lot of bonefish spawning out of pipes and cannons. And dry bones are also here. It's fairly simple and can easily be beaten. The thing with this level though, is that there is a secret warp that brings you to a completely different level within the level. This level within a level having not a single enemy, but it is designed to be solely platforming focused. A challenging gauntlet of spikes and moving blocks, which was also inspired a bit by Cave Story. The codes to these levels are on screen now, so if they interest you, check them out. Or maybe my other levels too. Give me hearts on them, please. I am absolutely desperate for any sense of validation. Super Mario Maker 2 is a brilliant tool that's charming, fun, and easy to use. Nintendo really focused on what new things they could add to build upon the original. It's a really good game. One that I don't feel the desire to play at all anymore. Let's talk about that, shall we? I don't know if it's just me and the inevitable bias that I have, but it seems to me that many people dropped interest with Mario Maker 2 much sooner than we all had anticipated. Mario Maker 1 was such a huge thing on the internet, even with the low sales of the Wii U, especially for YouTubers and streamers. But I get the impression now that there's not that many people giving the game the light of day anymore. Nintendo themselves haven't been giving the game the light of day either, as they haven't been prioritizing updates with Mario Maker 2. After six months of nothing, Nintendo finally did give us some type of an update, but it's been almost a year and we still have no idea what they meant by extra styles, plural. Are they going to be adding more styles or not? Maybe Mario Maker 2 didn't make as big of a splash as they had hoped. It's certainly possible the first game was akin to lightning in a bottle. Nintendo had never done anything like this before, so it was huge and exciting the first time around. In contrast, when Mario Maker 2 was announced, it was exciting to see, but ultimately unsurprising and expected. We knew it would have been coming eventually. It had to have. Now that we have it, eh, I guess most of us were ready to move on after a week or two with this game. I mean, it is just the first game, but more, right? So it kinda seems most of us had gotten most of the fun out of this idea of the first time around. Moreover, Mario Maker 2 feels like a game of diminishing returns. At first, there's plenty for you to do. You have story mode, you can check out all the popular levels, maybe if you're feeling inspired, you'll make some levels, but over time, after you've done the story mode, after you've made some levels, and after you've played so many levels that you start noticing trends and patterns and they all start feeling samey, by then it just becomes harder to find levels that feel fun and exciting again. It feels like Nintendo gave us a tool with so many countless possibilities, but somehow you're playing the same couple dozen stages again and again. It's then that you'll be reaching the point where sifting through the garbage just isn't really worth the candle anymore, and you'll just stop feeling the urge to play altogether. And these extra modes don't do much in order to spice things up either. It just simply gets to the point where playing the game becomes an uphill battle to try to find some fun in it. To get the most out of Mario Maker 2, you have to have a sort of willingness to go out of your way, and I just can't be bothered anymore. I applaud Nintendo for the tool that they had made here, and I did get over 60 hours of enjoyment out of it, but I think I'm gonna check out now. Again, Super Mario Maker 2 is a really good game. A good game that I just have no desire to play anymore. I can safely say there is no reason I will ever feel the urge to play Mario Maker 2 in the future. There is no possible way I could get roped into playing again. There's 100% no interest in it that I will ever... I was this close to being done talking about this game. On April 22nd of 2020, Nintendo released the last major update to Super Mario Maker 2, adding an assortment of new features and mechanics. Let's talk about the most obvious and arguably the biggest addition, the Super World Maker. This is a feature that most fans have been wanting ever since the first Mario Maker, and it's honestly something I never expected for Nintendo to follow through with. It allows users to create their own worlds, from an array of world themes that you could expect from a Mario game at this point. 
Grass world. Desert world. Ice world. Forest. Okay, we're not doing this again. These worlds may use some music for Mario 3 and World, but the graphic style can only be for Mario World. Which is a bit of a shame, not having Mario 3 or Mario U style maps, or perhaps even a revamped Mario 1 styled map. Especially considering that, with only one style, these worlds will only blend together and start feeling too samey if you play long enough. And yet, it's the functionality that's what's important here. The ability for creators to select a series of levels to be played in order. They may be arranged based on theming or by a difficulty curve. This concept gives way to the possibility to find great level after great level without having to do constant searching. Because before, even if you found a great level through, let's say, endless mode or through the popular tag, after two to four minutes, the level is bound to be over and the search would start again for yet another level. But with these worlds, you can have back to back to back levels to enjoy up to a maximum of 40, which, given a rough estimate, is about half the length of a real Mario game. Someone can put months of work into 8 worlds with 40 amazing levels worth of content to play. But good luck finding worlds like that, that are actually worth playing, without a lot of trial and error. A lot of trial and error. The system to select worlds is simply not as good as it should be. You get a lowly amount of information on someone's super world before you commit to playing it. You get told the user's name, how many worlds there are, and how many levels there are. You do not get told how difficult the levels are. You do not get told what types of levels there are. No mention of any tags or Mario styles present within the world. You do not get any sort of description of the world to help you pick and choose what you want to play. As it is, it's akin to throwing a dart at a board, blindfolded, and just hoping for the best. This is not good. This is not intuitive. Did I want to choose a world that's nothing but nearly identical speedrun levels with dropping blue platforms? No. Did I want to choose a world that's nothing but the exact same Auto Mario stage but in the different Mario styles? No! If given a brief profile of the world before I played it, would I have chosen to have played this world? Or whatever is going on here? Would I have deliberately chosen to play this nightmare? Would I ever have dreamed about playing a world that was just a refreshing level? No. This is not fun. This does not make me want to play people's super worlds. I am, again, having to go out of my way to try to find the fun in this game. More so than I feel it should be necessary for a mode like this. This was a fantastic concept with poor execution. But let's see what else this update has to offer, hmm? It appears we really never will know what Nintendo could have done with brand new styles. Instead, we have a Mario 2 USA Mushroom, which changes up the gameplay, letting you interact with enemies as if you were in Mario 2, meaning you can stand on them and throw them at other enemies. They've also included the key for Mario 2 that has Fanto chase you if you try to nab it. But it doesn't feel like you can accomplish too much with them, especially compared to if Mario 2 was actually given its own theme. But we have to let that dream die. Do you get what I did there? Because it's just a dream in Mario 2? Frog suit in Mario 3 is pretty cool. It allows people to make more fun water levels that don't feel as slow. They also added a new ability for Frog Mario, where he can run on water if he's holding an item. This feels like a very specific ability that actually took me a second to understand since it's not the most intuitive thing to have to hold a power block in order to achieve this, but it adds some much needed versatility to the power up. You also jump ever so slightly higher as Frog Mario, though it's still at the bottom of the Mario power up tier list I just made up and no one can debate me because I'm right. Super Acorn in Mario U is cool, I enjoy. Boomerang in 3D World is cool. I enjoy. I also enjoy the added wearables of the Cannon Box, the Propeller Box, the Goomba Mask, and the brand spanking new Red Pal Box and the Bullet Bill Mask. These add some much needed variety to the 3D World style, as before this style never felt as fleshed out as it should have been. Even now it still could have used some more things, 
Like, a dojo theme would have been great. Or how about some charging chucks, since they're still not in the game at all? Or how about the mice enemies actually interacting with blocks when they jump? But these new items do at least help 3D World feel more interesting to design for. The new power balloon is a much more interesting take on the power-up that only appeared in Mario World. This certainly wasn't making the rounds of anyone's favorite power-up list, in hopes of it one day making a grand return to a new game, but this upgraded and more modern take on the idea feels much more fun to control, and much more versatile to design for. For the first time in years, we can finally again say that it feels good to see the Koopalings again. Before this update, people had very few choices for bosses. You could either design a battle around Bowser, Bowser Jr., or Boom Boom. There were the odd occasions where someone got really creative and were able to design their very own unique bosses, but these were few and far, far between. But now, people have much more to work with, with seven new bosses being added. Even if some people can't help themselves and just decide to throw everything at you at once. And lastly on our list are Mecha Koopas. As the only new type of enemy here that isn't a boss, they are a welcome addition. They can give way to some fun level design ideas, especially considering that there are three variations of them. Man, with all these new features and concepts added to the game, I bet the community is just bursting with worthwhile content, huh? I bet this update will revitalize my feelings for Mario Maker. I bet this will feel like another Mario Maker renaissance. Let's check out the popular levels. Okay, well this is just a speedrun level like we've seen before, but now with Squirrel Mario. Oh hey, another refreshing course, but now it utilizes items from the new update. This really changes things up. You know, I think it's a good sign for the community at large that I'm seeing refreshing courses take up literally half of the top 10 popular levels right now. This level doesn't include anything new from the update, and it's just another speedrun level, but hey, it's pretty fun I guess. Look at that. We have eight more identical refreshing courses taking up the top 100 most popular stages. Fantastic. Wait, this looks kind of familiar. Here's another identical refreshing course taking up another spot in the top 100 stages. Wait, this looks kind of familiar. To its credit, this is yet another refreshing course, but it's the first refreshing course I've ever seen that's not just in the 3D world style, so it's still worth less than nothing, but, uh, um... Uh, with several more hours of Mario Maker 2 under my belt, thanks to this update, I can safely say, yeah, I'm still over Mario Maker as a franchise. I'm done. I'm out. Spending hours just to find tiny morsels of good, fun content is not worth it. Trudging through nearly identical levels that just shuffle through the same ideas is not worth it. Even with a major update like this, Mario Maker 2 isn't saved. But to be honest, I don't think it could have been. For me, the intrigue of Mario Maker has run its course. It was an explosive new idea back in 2015, but now it's lost all of its luster. Unless you have far too much time to kill and don't mind shuffling through endless garbage. Not even adding features people were begging for could have helped. Also, they still never added a beach theme to the game. Okay, now I am done talking about Mario Maker 2. Good lord. The script for this 2D Mario retrospective series has been worked on for over a year now. Let's just get to the conclusion of all of this, shall we? Some people say the Super Mario Maker games make any future new Super Mario Bros. game impossible to make. Or at the very least, pointless due to the nature of Mario Maker. While I feel that's not true at all, I do feel it is time to let the new series die. It was a series born from trying to get back the casual market into 2D Mario with the DS and Wii game, which then just happened to continue onto the 3DS and Wii U. But with the Nintendo Switch, I think it's time to move on. 2D Mario still has potential and reason to exist outside of the Super Mario Maker games. It's just that they need to come up with new ideas that aren't possible in the commercialized, easy to digest and use space of Mario Maker or the new Super Mario Bros. franchise. And it's clear that they still have some imagination for Mario, to come up with wacky ideas that feel strange, but somehow still fit very well for Mario. As we can see from all the unique features that Mario Maker 2 brought, 
Where were all these ideas back in the new Super Mario Brothers days? I don't think it's fair to the development teams in charge of Mario to say that there's nowhere to go after a level creation tool. Even still, people are not going to be excited about Mario Maker 3 if all it is is just more of what we got before but with a handful of new things added. I think Mario Maker 2's existence is proof enough of that. I'm sure those people on Nintendo will be able to show off something soon that will manage to blow our minds in a whole new way as they have many times before. Over the course of all these years, the development teams at Nintendo were able to consistently find new, imaginative ways to create a sense of magic and wonder with a concept so simple as a chubby Italian man running and jumping around. I look forward to seeing what the future awaits for 2D Mario, but in the meantime, I know I'll get plenty of enjoyment from playing any of these classic titles for the millionth time over. I'm sure you've noticed that I hadn't talked about every aspect of each game we've touched on, but if I had attempted that, we'd be here all day, and that would get really boring. But I feel like I had covered everything that I wanted to, and felt was interesting enough to talk about. But if there was anything that you feel I missed, and that you admire, or detest, about the 2D Mario games, go ahead and share your thoughts in the comments. I would love to see this admiration, or public humiliation, of Mario continue down there. But I think this video has been self-indulgent and lengthy enough. This is where our journey ends. Thanks for watching, and good night.